I would like to take your permission to share my slides. Is it okay, Mr. Tofiq? Yes, doctor. So once again, good evening. Uh, today, uh, webinar topic is a workshop on the appropriate use of the respiratory devices and everything about the respiratory system. Well, we have an eminent uh, speaker from UK, Dr. Bart from Nottingham, UK. Dr. Bart is the first time presenting in the Dubai Pediatric Club. We are honored to have him in a short while. I'll be introducing him because he's uh, for the first time presenting. We have with us uh, Dr. Fatma Jassem, Senior Consultant Pediatric Pulmonologist at Latifa Hospital. And soon they will uh, join uh, Jalila. She, she's well known in Dubai, UAE, and GCC countries. No need to introduce her. Everybody knows. We also have with us Dr. Uh, Rajinder Joshi, the past president of Dubai Pediatric Club and senior specialist pediatrician at the Prime Group, and Dr. Kalpana Sen Gupta, senior specialist pediatrician, head of the Department of Pediatrics at the NMC Specialty Hospital Dubai. She is secretary of the club. Well, I have a question for the audience. Those who answer right will announce the name. These two gentlemen here, they are the pioneers of uh, pediatric pulmonology in Europe, UK. So uh, you will have two, 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 three minutes time to think and write your answer in the chat box or question and answer box. Beautiful Dubai, one of the best cities in the world, most clean, beautiful. So I would like to invite uh, all those who have not seen uh, Dubai and UAE to come and see this beautiful city. Members of Dubai Pediatric Club, Members of the executive committee of the Dubai Pediatric Club, I mentioned Dr. Joshi, Dr. Kalpana, Dr. Diari, Dr. Diari is the chairman of the academic affair. Now they have moved to Ajalila Hospital. He's consultant pediatric surgeon, Dr. Amir Tolema, Dr. Ayman Jundi, Dr. Rafia, Dr. Bandari, Dr. Leila, and Dr. Khaled. Well, as I said, tonight we have uh, our eminent speaker, Dr. Jaish Bhatt, consultant in respiratory pediatrics at the Nottingham Children's Hospital, one of the busiest hospitals in UK. In a short while, uh, I will uh, give a brief profile. I've circulated the profile of Dr. Bhatt and Dr. Fatma. In a short while, I'll be telling about Dr. Bhatt. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Joshi, the past president, Dr. Kalpana, Secretary of the club, they will be moderating the session. And I would like to request all the viewers to write their question in the question and answer box. We have a very good panel tonight. They will answer all the questions. Well, on 26th of this month, Sunday, we are having neurology webinar. Eminent speaker, Dr. Sandeep Mordekar from the UK. He's our speaker. We have in the panel, uh, Dr. Aman Sohel, consultant pediatric neurologist at Neuropedia. Dr. Sa uh, Sunny Philip, consultant pediatric neurologist at WellCare Group. And Dr. Manoj Singh, consultant pediatric neurologist at NMC, Sharaj NMC, Dubai. The moderators, Dr. Kalpana and Dr. Rafia, will be there. Well, I was telling you uh, today our sponsor is the uh, Himalaya, how it is to form one incident in life changes the path. In 1930, somebody called Mr. Muhammad Manal, this gentleman. He was in then Burma, now Myanmar. In 1930, he was riding in the jungle forests of Burma. He suddenly he noticed that agitated, restless elephants, when given the root of a plant, they become quiet. He was surprised, it was very surprising for him what is inside this root which makes this elephant quiet. He does research and he 
1930 established this factory. Now it is based in Bangalore, and now they are in more than 106 countries throughout the world. You know, it's struggle. Everything is start from zero. Even he went and sold the gold and bangles to buy one machine, tablet forming machine to make tablet. And in 1934, they made a medicine from this Rawolfia serpenta, which they were giving to the elephant and made the serpenta the tablet for hypertension. And now uh, in a short video, they will show you. Well, to, uh, today's uh, topic is workshop. I came across this uh, poster. Is that marriage is also a workshop. Where the husband works and the wife shops. That is also a workshop. Well, a brief history of pediatric pulmonology. Always I start in the memory of Hippocrate, the father of medicine, who showed us the way. One of his quotations, this is written on the wall of one of the medical schools in the United States. Life is short and the art long. <clears throat> the occasion instant. Experiment perilous. Decision difficult. This, this holds good to a child who is in respiratory distress in a dying condition. Of course, Dr. Bart will tell us how to approach. This is Hippocrates. Hippocrates is the first who used the term asthma. In Greek meaning window to blow for a panting or respiratory distress. Everything starts from Hippocrates. And the father of pulmonology, Lenek, who invented the stethoscope. About the stethoscope in previous webinars, I have told you. Well, this was before Lenek uh, discovered the stethoscope. They used to put the chest, I mean, ear on the chest and uh, listen to the sound like this. But after invention of the um, a stethoscope by Lanek, doctors over centuries never forgave Lanek for his discovery. They were very angry. But this is the evolution of the stethoscope, how he evolved and came. And this is the simulation of what Lanek is doing in here. Now the era of electronic, with electronic devices, they see everything. Well, some of the pioneers, Pioneers in the North America, they are the pioneers of pediatric pulmonology in North America. Dr. Mallory, Dr. Kendrick, <clears throat> Dr. Melins, of course, he is considered the father of pediatric pulmonology. Dr. Keynes and Dr. Wall. Well, as I mentioned before, also Dr. Melins, a founding father in the field of pediatric pulmonology in America and North America. Dr. Melins work led to the understanding of pulmonary edema, ventilation in infancy and childhood, lung mechanism, and community approach to asthma. We must remember the pioneers. Beautiful painting by Howard showing a sick child in distress. Look at the family's condition. Everybody is distressed. I'm sure today Dr. Bart will solve all this problem. Well, in the UK, 50s to 60s, it was the founding fathers emerged in this field. One of them, Kenneth Cross, who began a study mechanism of breathing in the newborn. And the other in 1962, was Dr. Dick Jones, a pediatrician at Alder Health Children's Hospital in Liverpool. That showed the exercise for eight to 12 minutes produced fall in FEV1. Well, this is the question now, those who have answered rightly, two of the pioneers in the field of pediatric pulmonology in UK, Dr. Arctic Norman and Paul Hall, David Hall, David Hall. Dr. Norman was a British pediatrician described as a pioneer in the treatment of respiratory diseases. And Dr. David Hall, very famous. He developed a respiratory unit at Great Almond Children Hospital and set up a new pediatric unit at Nottingham. The place where our speaker, Dr. Bart is there. Dr. Bart must be knowing them uh, very well. Uh, um, Oh, they had a group very famous in the UK, Dr. Milner, Dr. Price, Dr. Weller, Dr. Haig, and Dr. Coxville. Well, some of the pioneers in UK, you see, uh, very famous. And here you see here, Dr. Norman and Dr. Uh, uh, Hall, and a group of other pediatricians. Well, it, it was during 70s that pediatric pulmonology began to emerge in the UK. Pediatric Assembly of the European Respiratory Society. 
And its first head was Max Zach, who went to become president of the European Respiratory Society. Just to remember. Now, this is a busy clinic, uh, like in Nottingham or in India or anywhere else, whatever it may be. Taking history or in a quiet place at home, a beautiful drawing by Norman Rockwell, physical examination from infancy till adulthood is must. Well, about some of the devices, then actually making how the devices in the respiratory system evolved. Well, regarding nebulizer and inhaler, the first powered or pressurized inhaler was invented in France by Dr. Serge Giron in 1858. And in 1864, the first steam driver nebulizer was invented in Germany by Dr. Siegel, a steam uh, spray inhaler. I will briefly just mention, then came the era of the ne <coughs> pneumatic uh, nebulizer. And from the 30s onward, they, they, they were using uh, a detail of that I will mention. Well, as I mentioned, in the 50s, pressurized meter dose inhaler came 1956. In 1964, electronic nebulizer or ultrasonic wave nebulizer came. And today we have ultrasonic wave nebulizer, which are used at the humidifiers also. Well, this is a timeline of the uh, development of this device. See here, everything, as I said, starts from beginning 2000 BC, India, Egypt. Then come Hippocrates, who used pot and reed. Then uh, 1550, in American Indians. Then the first inhaler in 1778. I'm not going to detail of that. Till we come here in 2005, the dry powder inhaler, MDI, which uh, Dr. Uh, Botvin mentioned. And this is a notion that from 1778, uh, Dr. John March invented this uh, inhaler. How it developed and came the Shell Giron and uh, George Mason. Beautiful painting by Wesling is showing an atomizer in the hand of this uh, the doctor and the child is surprised looking, what is this instrument? And everything ancient is very interesting, the instruments and how to know this, how they, they develop. These are some of the ancient nebulizer inhalers through the history. I'm not going to the detail of those, but one uh, must remember that how it develop and we have the latest instrument today. And this is Regarding the uh, yoga, there is a yoga technique, especially in the Indian subcontinent. They do for sinusitis, upper respiratory allergy, rhinitis. This is an arson in yoga, they call it. And these are devices because the respiratory system is a united airway from nose to the chest. That is why some of the drugs, especially the leukotriene receptor antagonists, they act on the nose also, on the lung also, because the receptors are there. Well, these are some of the new uh, instruments that uh, Dr. Bart will mention. I'm just showing even the animals also, they use the nebulizer. Now, beautiful paintings by Luke Feldes and <coughs> Hans. See, from newborn and infant to uh, uh, toddlers, all children and adults in distress, asthma, respected distress. If you control them well, they will become the superstar heroes and well-known people in the world. They become Olympic champion. David Beckham, Paul the Skull, Jamita Bachan is also here. The celebrities, if it is controlled, you can go and become Olympic champion. Now our Olympic champion, Dr. Jayesh Bhatt. I'll just briefly introduce Dr. Jayesh Bhatt is a consultant, the pediatric pediatric at Nottingham Children's Hospital. He looks after children with all respiratory problems, but his special interests include children with bronchopulmonary dyspnea, open lung disease, cystic fibrosis, asthma, preschool wheeze, and chronic cough. He established a BPD service in Nottingham. Since it was established, over 350 patients have been discharged on home oxygen. He provides respiratory exercise for the nationally funded attack and injectation clinic in Nottingham. This clinic receives referral from international centers. 
He chaired the European Task Force and produced a statement on multidisciplinary respiratory management at Atacha Challenger Asia. He is a member of the task force which has produced the European Respiratory Society statement on tracheobronchomalacia in children. He is the immediate past president of British Pediatric Respiratory Society 2016-19. He served as a member of the Commission on Human Medicine, Pediatric Medicine Expert Advisory Group as Pediatric Respiratory Specialist. He has held various teaching and training roles nationally. Previously, he chaired the College of Specialist Advisory Committee Active Senior Examiner for RCPCH Clinical Examination and internationally for European Respiratory Society. He is a member of Pediatric HERMS Examination Committee. There's a very big CV and profile, very nutshell. And these are the references. Beautiful Dubai. Once again, I invite you to come to this beautiful city. With this, I end. Now, I would like to request uh, Dr. Bart to start uh, his talk. Uh, I would like to request all the viewers to write the question, the question and answer box. In the during question and answer, Dr. Bart and Dr. Fatima will answer all questions. Over to Dr. Bart, please. Dr. Bart. Good evening. Uh, uh, it's going to be tough for me to follow that act. Uh, I think you've done the talk for me already, so I, I don't know how I'm going to follow that. But thank you very much for the, the kind introduction and a very kind in, invitation to do the talk. Uh, uh, yes, I do uh, have all those roles, but I am a clinician. I, I teach uh, uh, doctors to become respiratory pediatricians, but my first job is to teach uh, and to treat and teach patients. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And the remit that was given to me was to talk about um, office pediatric pulmonology. And then clearly, you know, you, you can't talk about everything. So I'll, I've chosen a few things that on a day-to-day -day basis allows you to look after children with asthma. So I think hopefully by the end of this, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll uh, suggest an approach, uh, an outpatient uh, diagnostic approach for asthma, focusing on indications for performing um, certain diagnostic tests and then the pros and cons of each of the tests. And then uh, after that, I will discuss about the principles that underlie um, a treatment with aerosols. Uh, and um, I think um, in that you need to know really very well how the inhalers work so that you can then teach your patients to use them properly so that the clinical outcomes improve. That, that's the bottom line. Okay, we, we should remember that, you know, asthma is, is uh, something that has a clinical diagnosis and there, there isn't, uh, you know, a consistent gold standard diagnostic criteria. So you cannot take one test at one time and say yes or no to asthma. Uh, and then therefore, I think um, uh, whatever guidelines you look at, whether the latest ERS task force or the GINA guidelines or the BTS or the a American guidelines, you know, it, it's difficult to make an unequivocal evidence-based recommendation for diagnosis of asthma. And therefore, there's always slight variability in, in the recommendations. And there are reasons for that. And I'll, I'll cover some of that. Uh, and, and that is for you to understand on a day-to-day -day basis. If you are doing a test, if you are using a particular piece of equipment, what does that test result mean and how do you interpret that in light of the clinical picture that is in front of you and remember whatever test you use they they influence the probability of a diagnosis of asthma it doesn't prove that this child has got asthma and you might need to repeat tests at different occasions and and therefore you know you can say yes or no uh, at this point in time i cannot confidently say this is asthma you might have to repeat the test um, and, and it is, the diagnosis will be based on, it's like putting a, a thousand piece of jigsaw picture together. So you need to take each bit of the information, the history, the, as, as Dr. Tamerai suggested in his beautiful paintings, uh, along with the detailed clinical examination, but also that characteristic pattern of signs and symptoms, how that fits in with the classical test. And if they are not present, if there is absence of this test, then you should look for alternative diagnosis. And you should be doing that at each and every stage. Uh, and then also remember that the clinical picture, the symptoms, uh, examination, 
will vary over time. Asthma is a disease with significant variability, okay? There is variability uh, over time in terms of presence of symptoms, variability in terms of intensity of symptoms, okay? And because of these uh, difficulties, uh, you know, um, unlike say, for example, uh, you're looking at a child with hyperglycemia and uh, they got ketoacidosis, uh, then you know, it is a, a robust way to say this is diabetic ketoacidosis. That is not the case with asthma. And therefore there is potential both for overdiagnosis of asthma and, and underdiagnosis. And I think depending upon which study you look at, it could be as much as uh, just under half of children might receive a diagnosis of asthma if you don't take the whole picture into consideration. And there are some children who might be at risk of not getting the appropriate treatment. And there is a potential for them to have really adverse outcomes, including death. Okay, so it's, it's really the tip of the icebergs when you see the child and, and they're present with, with the, the symptoms. That's only the tip of the iceberg. And, and remember, this is one of the most important slides from my presentation. The three basic underlying things that are happening in, um, in asthma is there is airflow limitation, so increased airway resistance. There is bronchial or airway hyper responsiveness. Uh, so the air breathing tubes are more twitchy and there is inflammation. And if you think of these three things through each and every uh, part of the asthma journey, then it will help you explain to your patients the symptoms they're getting. It will help you understand the symptoms they're getting and then do the tests which might help you prove or exclude these things. And when you do the treatments, you understand why you're using the treatment for airflow limitation, what treatments are there for bronchial hyperresponsiveness, and what for airway inflammation and assessing treatment response. So I think this is a really important slide. Always keep this in mind. You know, yes, the symptoms are just the tip of the iceberg. Underneath there is airflow limitation, bronchial or airway hyperresponsiveness, airway inflammation. Okay, so uh, Gina, and this is the most re latest recommendation uh, about um, making you know, the diagnostic criteria for children who are six to 11 years old. And, and they should have you know, more than one of these uh, symptoms, uh, V's. And bear in mind in, in several cultures, there isn't actually a, a word for V's. And you might need to use, uh, you know, there are apps available which will be able to make the parents listen and say, is this the noise that your child makes? Don't use the term, is your child wheezing? Actually, you should be asking what sort of noise your child makes. Is it the noise your child makes on breathing out? Um, difficulty breathing at various times in response to what triggers? Um, chest tightness, some children, young children may not be able to say they got that. They might say that the chest hurts and then cough. But the cough in isolation should never be um, used as a um, symptom for diagnosis of asthma. Cough has got to be present with these other things. And by and most of the times, the cough is a dry, irritating, tickly cough, which could be worse at night. And they, as I said, these symptoms will vary in, in time, also in intensity. There might be times when the cough's worse, the wheezing might be worse with, uh, um, um, if they got a virus, um, these symptoms are often worse at night or at first thing on, on waking up, and they could be triggered by various things, exercise, laughter, allergens, um, temperature changes, cold weather, uh, emotional upsets, um, and they are often worse in terms of viral infections. So going back to that iceberg, you know, the V's and the shortness of breath and the chest tightness are telling you of the airflow limitation, the cough is telling you of the underlying airway inflammation and the um, bronchial hyperresponsiveness. And the variability over time and intensity again tells you that the airways are inflamed and they are hyper responsiveness. They are hyper responsive. So, in response to various triggers like exercise, like emotional upsets, like stress, they will then more readily become more inflamed and more narrowed. And therefore, you get the um, uh, increased work of breathing and the wheezing. So that's the symptoms you tease out, but um, now I'll come to more details in how you prove that there is presence of airflow limitation, but I'll just put that detail Gina slide and I don't expect you to go into to read this. When you're making, looking at the symptoms, it should be a structured assessment. I think just uh, um, open-ended questions uh, and asking them randomly doesn't uh, lead to a proper assessment. So, you know, you should be asking about where these symptoms present and then what are these triggers. And actually you, your shed self should confirm that there is wheeze because there is a lot of evidence that even healthcare professionals 
may identify different noises as Vs. And then when it, you compare it to a gold standard, which um, is a pediatric pulmonologist saying that this is Vs, there is significant variability in that. So don't go by the parent saying that my child Vs, you need to confirm it by yourself that there has been wheezing. Presence of atopic history in the child or in the family will always be handy, and that will add to one of the pictures in the jigsaw, but it's not in itself diagnostic of asthma. If you, know, you don't have these classical symptoms, and if there are any red flag symptoms like neonatal onset of symptoms, like a persistent wet cough, faltering growth, finger clubbing, persistent crackles, no V's whenever there is difficulty breathing, uh, then you should be thinking of an alternative diagnosis. This is a concept that we all need to really uh, grasp very well. And, and, and asthma is a very variable disease. And um, often the symptoms are worse overnight or first thing in the morning. And clearly if the parents and the child are not alert to that, they may under report the symptoms. And clearly in your office practice, you won't be seeing them at those times. So you won't be able to assess that. And, and, and in terms of uh, how do you capture that, really the peak flow monitoring and the variability is the only diagnostic tool available to us, which will capture that. And you need to do that <coughs> over a period of two weeks minimum. Now, if you use say two peak flow readings in 24, 24 hours, then it is possible that by 30 to 40%, you might under assess that. So I think if you are able to tell the families that they, they need to do it every six hours, so six, uh, four times in 24 hours over a fortnight, and they should be done with an electronic peak flow meter so that those readings are actually transferred directly to your um, office computer, then that will be a test which will help you assess the diurnal variability in the peak flow monitoring. And as I said, it's, it's actually usually worse at night or early in the morning. And the same applies to air, airway inflammation and airflow obstruction. Both of them actually also peak um, early in the morning or, or late at night. And you're not gonna be seeing the child at that time in, in your office. So if you did your spirometry, you, you might get a normal reading, but that doesn't exclude that this child might be having those um, symptoms and, and the airflow limitation and more inflammation at nighttime. Same applies to the bronchial hyperresponsiveness. So if you did a methacholine challenge, and I'll talk more about that later on, or, or an exercise challenge, then if depending on the time of the day you do it, you might get a variable result. So you need to bear in mind that if you, there is a very strong clinical suspicion of asthma and you've done a test and the test is normal, or it doesn't confirm um, significant bronchial hyperresponsiveness or bronchoconstriction, you might need to repeat it at different points. It's become repetitive, but the same applies to exhaled nitric oxide. And actually there is variability like the peak flow, there is variability in the levels of exhaled nitric oxide during the 24 hour period as well. And that seems to be actually more uh, better at predicting uh, poor asthma control. Uh, we're not talking about diagnosis here, but uh, in terms of control as compared to the peak flow. If you look at other biomarkers, like you know, if you're able to get samples from the airway for eosinophilia or do a peripheral blood count eosinophilia, or indeed even total IgE levels, they all demonstrate variability during the day. This is diurnal variability we're talking about. Okay, so this is a really important concept to grasp. And I think we often don't keep this in mind when we order tests or we're using um, different uh, investigations to confirm or exclude asthma. And it's not just day to day. It's actually, there is um, not on a, just 24 hours. That is, you know, things might be in the early in the week, things might not be as bad, but then it's part of the weekend, things might get worse again and over time as well. So all the symptoms, the underlying pathophysiology and the biomarkers, they have variability on a daily basis over a longer period as well. Along with that, you got to be mindful of, you know, if the child is sensitized to a particular allergen, if they got pets in the house or house this mite, or indeed seasonal allergens like uh, grass pollen, tree pollen, they might have a positive test, and, and we can talk about that later on, uh, but there might not be ongoing exposure. So in a, a child might be atopic and sensitized to cat, but the family may not have a cat in the house. So as well as sensitization, ongoing exposure is important. On top of that, if there is allergen exposure and the child is sensitized and the weather is damp and the child gets a virus, all that comes together to suddenly make the child very unwell and the child ends up in the hospital with asthma. 
there's some very elegant studies done from Manchester, which, which looked at uh, three things. So allergen sensitization, allergen exposure, and uh, presence of a virus. If you had only two out of the three, as compared to all three, there was a six fold difference in the likelihood of a child being admitted to the hospital with asthma. And this has been shown in adults as well. So I think just a positive test is not allergy. You need to have sensitization, a positive test, along with exposure and then other factors like a virus or a weather change or stress, whatever. Okay, now I've explained to you about the variability of how different um, biomarkers and symptoms and under, underlying pathophysiology might change. Along with that, actually, when you do the test and especially the lung function test, they are very much effort dependent, okay? Effort um, both on part of the, the child who is doing it and part of the, the performer, the instructor who's telling them to do the task. Okay, so there is variations in that. And then there is, that will depend and, and change how reproducible the test is. So you got to be looking at the, the flow volume loops and saying, look here, this is not right. You need to repeat again. You need to give them proper instructions to make sure that they get that test right. And then there is, that's reproducible over two or three occasions. And then you can start, start making um, final conclusions about what that test means. But be wary of using fixed cutoffs. So I, I'll tell you about some of the cutoffs as we go along, but saying that, okay, this much reduction in, in FEV1 after this particular stimulus is diagnosed with asthma at one point in time. No, be wary of that. I think be mindful of the variability in intensity over time uh, and, and um, just be careful that you might need to repeat the test. If you've got a child at a good time, they might not have a positive test. Okay, and every time I think what you see may not be what actually it is going on in there. And, and so if you don't have the classical symptoms, the, the confirmatory test, then keep thinking of alternative diagnosis. Now, when you look at a, a you know, if you ask somebody to do a, a peak flow reading or, or they've done spirometry in your office practice, uh, when you start looking at the lung function, then you know what you need to do is obviously, as I've just alluded to, look at the technique, okay, and comment on the quality of the test. Even if you're not seeing the child do it, by looking at the shape of the flow volume loop, you would be able to say actually uh, this technique is not right, and therefore the, the interpretation is difficult, okay. But once you got the technique right, then what you look at is compare it with other, you know, the reference values. And I, and I hope now most people have moved on to the, the global lung equation and um, lung function Z scores, because I think that is looking at a, a comparison with a huge, a huge number of people across different age ranges in different ethnic groups, which has provided us with comparative values. So you need to use the most up-to-date reference equations in, in the, the spirometers. And then compare it. What is, does it look like an obstructive pattern? This is, you know, third, fourth year medical um, student uh, stuff. But you need to know. Well, this is obstructive. This is a restrictive lung defect. This is mixed picture. And then what is also important? Then what is it for the patient? So, you know, okay, you compared it to the general population. You have looked at the particular disease pattern. But what is it so on this occasion? This is this child's lung function. What was it before? Um, and you know, if you keep seeing the child serially, if he's had trials of treatment, what is it after the treatment? So I think it's really important to keep uh, looking at trends over time. And and then you know, the, a test on its own without the child in front of you doesn't mean anything. So have you done the test? But has it helped you answer the question that you um, initially asked? So has this child got reversible bronchoconstriction? Has this child got evidence of exercising this bronchoconstriction? So, you know, go back to the clinical question you were asking. And as you all know that, you know, values which are, uh, you know, below, uh, above or below the fifth percentile in both directions would be considered abnormal outside the, the normal range. Okay, so coming back to confirming, you know, uh, variable expiratory AL flow limitation, because remember that ice, um, iceberg slide, symptoms are just the tip of the iceberg. You have airflow limitation, which is variable. You have airway inflammation, you have a bronchial hyperresponsiveness. So how do you confirm variable expiratory airflow limitation? You know, you do that by doing a bronchoconstriction test and also document that there is variability as we talked about in terms of peak flow. So this is, you know, this has just been published. This was two weeks ago, um, you know, the ERS task force, uh, um, which um, 
uh, is for diagnosis of asthma in children for six to 11 years. Um, okay, this is for diagnosis of asthma. This is the first only pediatric guideline for diagnosis of asthma. And I, I recommend the, the, you, you should read that, okay? Uh, what I'm starting off with is telling you, first of all, that what does the task force recommend against, okay? It's telling you not to do this, okay? And I've already expanded on this quite a lot. Do not diagnose asthma based on symptoms alone, you know? They've got a cough, they've got noisy breathing, they've got difficulty breathing. You might have heard of these, but just symptoms without any objective evidence, be, be wary of making a diagnosis of asthma, okay? And, and you know, often in certain clinical settings, one might be tempted to say, okay, this sounds like asthma, use a clinical trial. And then some other guidelines in the past have suggested that. I think in, in your setting, if, if that is what you have to do, be mindful of using a time-limited trial. So, okay, you've got to say, this child's got cough, wheeze, difficulty breathing, chest tightness, and I've heard the wheeze. I'm going to use an inhaled corticosteroid for eight weeks. I'll ask the parents to maintain a diary. I'll teach them how to use the inhaler. And I, once they've got everything right, eight weeks later, I'll assess everything and I'll stop the treatment. Even if it's worked, tell the parents, we'll stop the treatment and we'll try and do this trial again. So if you're going to do uh, based on a treatment trial, that's how you would do it. But that, the task force actually says you shouldn't be doing that. Peak flow variability, I already told you that. Uh, uh, it's not recommending as the main thing to diagnose, the primary objective, but you might consider in certain healthcare settings where spirometry is not available. And, and two weeks measurement, and ideally, as I told you, using a peak flow uh, a meter. And you should be actually, if possible, doing um, four measurements in a day rather than just two. And, and you know, if there's more than 12% variability across the readings, actually the gene has suggest 13%, uh, then that's considered a, pos a positive test. Now, if that is not present, that will not exclude a diagnosis of asthma. Bear in mind that, okay? You might need to uh, do it again in the future. If you start doing spirometry, then I think, you know, the if the FEV1, FVC ratio, which would be the classical obstructive pattern, is less than 80%, or FEV1 on its own is less than 80% predicted, um, or below the lower limit of normal, which would be the, the two standard deviations, um, then you know that would be supportive on in the setting of the symptoms that you heard of diagnosis of asthma. But again, because of the variability and um, normal spirometry does not rule out diagnosis of asthma. Okay. When do you do bronchodilator responsiveness testing? If you find that the child's you know, FEV1 is in those ranges, which I put on the slide, then you might use 400 micrograms of salbutamol and 20 minutes later, check the FEV1 again. And if you see an improvement of 12% from baseline, then that is telling you that there is bronchial, reversible bronchoconstriction, the bronchodilator responsiveness test is positive and this would again support the diagnosis of asthma. But if it is not 12% on that occasion, that does not rule out asthma. So what would this look like? So this is, you know, if you have been used to the old um, uh, spirometers, and I'll put an extreme example here, but just to illustrate, you know, reversible bronchoconstriction. So this child starts off with an FEV even of 0.99, which is, you know, significant bronchoconstriction. You can see a typical obstructed loop here. Uh, and then following salbutamol, there is a very significant improvement in, in the FEV1, okay? So... <clears throat> Clearly, this was a classical case, a very severe case of uh, reversible bronchoconstriction. But it's also helpful to compare this. So this child was symptomatic at the time. When the child better, do it again, and then see whether there is reversible bronchoconstriction on that second occasion as well. So it's useful to compare this test, both when the child's symptomatic and, and when the child's uh, symptom-free. And that will allow you uh, in a document the variation over time, which I've been talking on and on again. This is, and you know, if you're using the new spirometers with the, the Z-scores, you can see that clearly um, in this case, the, the, the Z-score uh, improves um, uh, by, you know, from um, a Z-score of minus 2.34, it's, it's gone down to minus 0.04. So I think the ERS has given a 
cut off of if there is improvement in z score of, of minus 0 0.8 then that is uh, uh, suggestive of um, a significant bronchial hyper um, reversible bronchoconstrictions so you can see that this child also has very uh, good improvement after salbutamol okay but there are limitations for using this test and then i think if you use the 12 percent cutoff which is the recommendation from most of the guidelines you know the, the ers the gina the bts and or the ATS guidelines, it does have poor sensitivity, leaving aside the variability over time. Uh, and there are studies, and I'll put up three references here, which, which suggest that if you use um, a, a different cutoff, so I think if you use a lower cutoff, you might get a higher combined sensitivity than specificity. But also bear in mind that, that you know, children um, have got significant variability in their airway resistance anyway. So uh, over time, that may become difficult to tease out. So one of the suggestions by you know, some of the experts is that actually, rather than using a specific cutoff um, of 12% for diagnosis, it might be useful to keep looking at it over time uh, in terms of response to treatment, adherence to treatment, and, and breakthrough in control. It might be more helpful along those lines as well. What about bronchial hyperresponsiveness or airway hyperresponsiveness? You know, the way I explain to my patients and my families is that you know the child's breathing tubes are, are more twitchy than they need to be. By that, what I mean is that you know, if I go out in cold weather and I don't have twitchy tubes, my airways are fine. But if you have increased bronchial hyperresponsiveness, these airways will more readily get narrowed, will more readily get swollen. Maybe there will be more mucus hypersecretion as well. So that is bronchial hyperresponsiveness. And you can assess that in clinical practice. You can do by an indirect bronchial challenge, and I'll tell you that in a minute, or a direct challenge, or allergen-mediated. Now, allergen-mediated is never done in pediatrics. That's only done in research, so you, you forget that. What indirect test means is that whatever stimulus you're using, that's not working directly on the smooth muscle, airway smooth muscle, but it changes the environment of the airway such that whatever is happening in, in natural asthma happens due to that stimulus, you get release of mediators, you get bronchoconstriction, you get airway inflammation. And generally speaking, they do not have any late responses. You know, you get an immediate effect. The commonest indirect bronchial responsiveness test is exercise, which you all could do in your office practice. Uh, you know, there are other agents like uh, uh, FIDAS, uh, adenosine monophosphate, mannitol dry powder, which is often in, uh, used in general practice in the UK, uh, more in adults than in pediatrics, but also in you know, isocapnic hyperventilation. These are indirect tests are more specific for asthma, but they're not, you know, and they're very highly sensitive, but then therefore it may uh, confuse the picture, but they are quite specific. As compared to the direct um, uh, bronchial hyperresponsiveness test, what the direct test means is that whatever stimulus you're using, whether it's methacholine or histamine, it is acting directly on the airway smooth muscle. And everybody will have bronchoconstriction. But the dose at which it happens is important. So if it happens at a very low dose, that means, you know, even the tiniest amount of methacholine or histamine is making your airway smooth muscle to constrict. You have significant increased bronchial hyperresponsiveness. Well, if you kept on doing the test, even in somebody who doesn't have asthma, then at a very high dose, everybody will get bronchoconstriction. What we do is you stop at a certain dose and say you do not have bronchial hyperresponsiveness. So that's the direct uh, bronchial challenge. Okay, and what does the ERS task force recommend? It recommends you know, using direct challenge if you cannot confirm the diagnosis of asthma based on all what I've talked so far. And it's talking about using methacholine. And, and what PC20 stands for is that you know, the provocative concentration which leads to a 20% drop in FEV1, okay? So you start off with the saline and then you have doubling doses of uh, saline, then 0 0.125, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, doubling doses of methacholine. So the concentration at which you get a 20% drop in FEV1, that is PC20. Some people also report it as PD20, that is the cumulative dose, but I think the ERS task force is saying um, PC20. Histamine would work in a similar way, but in pediatrics, that's not what um, the um, ERS task force is suggesting. And interestingly, actually, Gina is saying that, you know, you should be doing the direct bronchial challenges, uh, reserve it mainly for adults. Remember, the direct challenges are very, very sensitive, but they're not specific. So if a child has got obliterative bronchiolitis 
or any other chronic lung condition, you might get or cystic fibrosis. You might get a positive direct responsiveness test. So it is quite sensitive, but not specific for asthma. So this is an example of, of a methacholine challenge test. So in, in the right hand side of the panel, you can see that this child starts off, you have a baseline lung function, and then you start off by giving them increasing concentration of uh, methacholine. As you can see that it, it sort of, you know, goes up the concentration. And then when you get to a point where you develop 20% drop, then this child has got, so you can see that here, that's the concentration of the methacholine. And at one, just over one milligram per mil, this child develops significant bronchial hyper, bronchoconstriction, 20% drop in FEV1. So this child has got increased bronchial hyperresponsiveness. Okay, and and just to illustrate the concept and how the things are different. So in in somebody in a direct test, and you kept on doing, you might get to a high dose where you might get bronchoconstriction. But in a child with asthma, you get that at a very low dose. And also the, the response is quite exaggerated. So with a tiny amount of methacholine, they get very significant bronchoconstriction. And this tells you that this child has got airway or bronchial hyper, hyper responsiveness. Okay, and the, uh, what about the indirect challenge? So the exercise, and this is something you might be able to use in your uh, office practice on a routine basis. Okay, it, it's, and, and you got to be careful that uh, it's not just making the child run up and down the corridor. They have, they have to be on a treadmill or, or a bicycle ergometer. And you know you need to have a, a specific temperature and barometric pressure in the office. And then you make the child do the running or the cycling for six to eight minutes. And, and you know, Dr. Tomera, I already mentioned about uh, the origins of the exercise test in Liverpool. So they, they do six to eight minutes submaximal. I mean, so they get to about 80% of their heart rate, maximal heart rate. And then you do baseline lung function. And then you do, you, uh, once they finish the test, you do the test at five, 10 and 15 minutes and see if there is any drop in their lung function. So this is an example of an exercise test which the child starts off at the baseline. Uh, you know, that's the predicted values. You can see that, that, that that's a good lung function. And then at five minutes post exercise, you see a, a significant drop, you know, 17%. So if the drop is 10% or more, then this is considered a, positive test for indirect bronchial hyperresponsiveness. okay? Mm -hmm. and, and you can see that when you look at the mid flows, there is even a more exaggerated drop in, in the mid flows because you have so many of them. So there is more variability, but there's a significant drop in the mid flows as well. And then what you do is you give the child salbutamol and you find that the lung function gets back to what it was a baseline or even slightly better than that. So this is a positive exercise test for confirming increased airway hyperresponsiveness. Now you then start looking at, so we talked about airway narrowing, we talked about airway, airway hyperresponsiveness, and now I'm gonna talk about um, eosinophic airway inflammation. Now, you know, there are invasive tests you can do. So if, if there is a reason to do a bronchoscopy for a child, and then you do that, and in, you know, if there is significant airway inflammation, you might see classical, you know, this is a, a bronchoalveolar lavage from a child with significant asthma. You might see examples of charcoal and crystals or clump of eosinophils, but these are invasive tests and they, they you know, it is uh, difficult to justify using them in all settings and in all children. So is there a non-invasive test of airway inflammation that you might use? And that's where exhaled nitric oxide comes into play. It's a surrogate marker for airway eosinophilia. It is not a diagnostic test for asthma. It is a marker for airway eosinophilic inflammation, which is TH2 driven, okay? And there are possible lot of applications for it, you know? In, in epidemiological studies, you know, people might use it for, to screen for, for asthma, but you know, remember there are limitations there. It's an epidemiological study. In terms of diagnosis, I think, as I've said, you know, it's only one piece in the jigsaw. So it might be an epi information that will help you build the picture, but it's not confirmation. Okay, if the child's doing well, and if you find that the nitric oxide is crept up when you're seeing them in the, in the clinic, it might be telling you that they know that the child's actually starting to relapse with an asthma. Okay, you might be able to titrate the dose of the inhaled corticosteroid if you have got facilities to monitor it on a regular basis and look at the trends, okay, and, and titrate the dose of the inhaled corticosteroids. And if you find that the, the child has got high exhaled nitric oxide and then that should go down. If you use steroids, oral or inhaled corticosteroids, that should go down with, with um, 
uh, it's corticosteroids. So I think it might be you know, helpful in predicting the response to steroids. Uh, and, and, and then you know, if you find that actually that there is no change, and then you might want to think of alternative treatments rather than just increasing the dose of the inhaled corticosteroids. Does it help predict exacerbation? So I think um, um, we just completed the Racino trial in the UK and the results were presented at the ERS. This was looking at, you know, um, you monitor the exhaled nitric oxide on a regular basis. And if suddenly the nitric oxide is spiking up, is it going to help predict exacerbations? This data is not yet published, so look out for that. But I think that might be some helpful information going forward. One other way to look at it is in terms of adherence. So as I said, I think if you've got eosinophilic inflammation, you monitor nitric oxide, you're giving them steroids, the nitric oxide should go down. So if it's not gone down, that means the child's not taking the steroids. There are some caveats here. In a, I've told you about the diurnal variability of the nitric oxide measurements. It could also be dependent on uh, you know, what the child has eaten. If, uh, if they've eaten some spinach-rich foods, if they had caffeine, they had coke in the morning, then nitric oxide can go up. And it's not that they're not adhering to the steroids. So bear all that in mind. But within those caveats, I think if you find that the exhaled nitric oxide is less than 20 parts per billion and when you're using a handheld monitor, then that's low. And that is helpful in saying that there is no current eosinophilic inflammation in this child's airway. 20 to 35 is intermediate. And then you know, clearly above 35 would be very high. So what does the task force recommend? It's saying that you know, using 25 as a cutoff value, it might be supportive of a diagnosis of asthma within the caveats I've just mentioned. Okay, now I think what I've done is I've, I've told you about that, uh, you know, how to do structured assessment of symptoms, looking at uh, a, a variability in airway narrowing, hyper responsiveness, inflammation, and how to measure that and what tests to do uh, by using what equipment. Now I'm gonna move on to that, you know, let's say you confirm the diagnosis of asthma and then you, you, you want to start treatment. And, and then you're gonna start treatment with them um, because we're talking about office practice. Um, I will not talk about nebulizers. I think there is no role of nebulized outpatient treatment for asthma. And I'm happy to answer that question and later on in, in the chat, but I think uh, I'm just gonna talk about inhaled uh, medications, but there are a few principles that you need to be mindful of. That, you know, what drug gets into your lung at what level is dependent on the particle size. I think that's really important. You know, and the measure you use is called the mass median aerodynamic diameter. So that's so the, the size around which most of the uh, volume of the, the mass of the drug is really uh, lying around. And, and I think uh, um, when you have a certain mass million um, um, MMAD, then that's going to make sure that the best deposition in the airway is going to happen with that. Okay. Uh, so, you know, clearly, you're looking at about a 50% MMAD with a uh, five micrometer, then that will probably the best size to, to get the lungs into the areas where you want the drugs to act. But also the shape um, of, of the particles, and then that is more in uh, response to some of the newer molecules that are coming about. And, and clearly position is important. The gravity also takes a part in, in, in settling of the particles. And, and, and then you know how fast or how slowly the, the airway aerosol is moving into the, into the uh, lungs. Okay, uh, it, it also depends on what drug is, you know, you are aware certain uh, corticosteroids, you know, uh, are, are, are different, even for the same formulation, like, for example, with QR, you, you might, the small ultra fine particle, you might get a higher depositions, you might need to use a lower dose. And then obviously, whether there's tidal breathing, or they're doing a long suck at, with a dry powder and inhaler. What about the lung anatomy and physiology? If clearly you got very significant, very severe airway hyperconstriction, then inhaled drugs may not work. And, and that's when in an acute setting, you might have to use intravenous bronchodilators um, and, and, and you have um, asymmetrical disease areas, for example, in cystic fibrosis and using inhaled antibiotics, then the, the drugs might deposit differently in different areas of the lung. So how does the, that aerosol get and deposit into the lungs? I think clearly there is the inertial impaction. So, you know, the, the walls, the particles would hit the air, the air and the wall of the airways and, and then settle down uh, by, by gravity. And then that will be improved by breath holding. So this is the really important bit. When you're asking, you're teaching your, uh, your patients about the inhaled treatment, the, the breath holding is important because that will allow, you know, and, and setting up straight uh, will allow a better gravitation sedimentation in, in uh, areas of the lung. And then obviously there is a slow diffusion growing forward as well. And, and there is, you know, because of electrostatic charges, there is some precipitation related to that. 
and finally interception. So all these are possible mechanisms in which the, the aerosols will get into your lungs. And and you know we inhale uh, you know uh, liters of air every day, and that air is not just air. There's so much in there, and we might be inhaling a lot of these things. And you can see that uh, you know they they come in different sizes. But when we're talking about the medical aerosols, it's the size of one to five um, um, micrometers that we are in interested in. That's because at that size, you know, you know you're, you're going to get the best deposition of um, um, those aerosol particles in the conducting areas where you want it to work. So how are you going to deliver the aerosols? You know, you might use pressurized meter dose inhalers um, or dry powdered inhalers. Um, I'll talk a bit about the, the, the unique soft mist inhaler, mm -hmm. and, and I won't talk about the nebulizers and other inhalers because, as I said, I think in office practice, there's no real role of nebulized treatment for bronchodilators. Now, when you talk about um, the, the two most common uh, types of devices, you know, the MDIs and DPIs, remember, you know, they're, they're very convenient, they're portable uh, and, and, you know, quite compact and they sit into the pocket of the child or the parent, okay? And, and they can deliver small volumes of aerosol in a metered doses very quickly. <clears throat> but remember, the, the aerosol generator and the drug are indissociable. So what that means is that you've got a canister of uh, salbutamol, you've got a canister of beclomethazone in the pressurized meter dose inhaler or in the DPI, that you cannot separate it out and you can alter that as opposed to say a nebulizer. So you, you might use the same nebulizer, you might give them a steroid, you might give them an antibiotic, you might give them salbutamol, whatever. So that's what we mean by that the generator and the drug are indissociable. If you forget everything else about my one, one hour, just over one hour talk, uh, remember these two lines, you know, the most important lines. When you're asking the child to use a pressurized meter dose inhaler, always with a spacer, it is slow and steady, okay? Slow and steady breath. And when it's the dry powder inhaler, it is quick and deep, okay? That's you know, the two important lines, the most important lines in my presentation. PMDI, slow and steady, even through a spacing. The dry powder inhaler, quick and deep. Why do we need to do that? Because I think the powder, that's how the aerosol gets generated. The, the drug is in the powder you know, uh, form, which is the carrier, and then there are fine micronized drug particles in that. And it might be whatever it, it, dry powder inhaler you might be using, whether it's a handy inhaler, active inhaler, turbo inhaler, ellipta, whatever device you're using, okay? And it may be single dose, it might be multiple dose, it might be blister steps, it might be in, in the coil, and they may then load the, the drug in, in a particular manner, whichever device you're using. And then when you have that uh, deep sustained suck, that inspiratory flow will shear and, and you know, the aerosol is generated as the dry powder disaggregates, okay? So the energy on deep inspiration is what is generating the aerosol. And the aerosol, as I've told you, is really important because if you don't get the aerosol of the right particle size, then it's not going to deposit well in the lungs. So, you know, the deep sustained suction inhalation that the child does will then disaggregate the powder to let the, the, the drug to go and deposit where it needs to. Okay, so that's where the main source of energy, you know, the inspiratory flow dependent deagglomeration. And then that will be different for different devices. And you can actually check, you know, you can use the in check device to, and, and see which would be the, uh, the best flow rate that the child is able to generate and then decide about the, the which device you might you want to use, okay? And, and the, the flow rates vary from less than 30 to more than 100 liters per minute. Uh, there are newer devices like the Ellipta, which is, is thought to generate an aerosol over a wide range of inspiratory flow rates. But these are all, all breath activated. So, you know, the child needs to long sustain deep breath. You know, that's how it's going to generate the aerosol, okay? It does not have any propellant. So it's, it's kinder to the environment. You don't have to worry about CFC or HFA. Okay, and, and the, even a younger child, as young as six, might be able to achieve better coordination. They can't do that with a PMDI. They will be able to do it with a, a, a dry powder inhaler. You don't need a spacer. You can use it, you know, they can get it out from the pocket and then they use it straight away. And there are, you know, there's ongoing improvement with, with um, the DPIs, you know. So there are, you know, as I said, the deagglomeration happens with inspiratory flow rate. And actually there are things that you can add in, which are called deagglomeration enhancer, which improves the quality of the aerosol. You know, there might be external energy sources to disperse the powder, right, powder rather than the child's inspiratory flow rate. Uh, and, and then in that case, you know, uh, you might be able to use other things like compressed air, uh, 
electrical vibration, but these are tools in development again. Okay? And there might be other changes you could make to, you know, the, the particle size using nanoparticles uh, or other carriers instead of the powder as there's a carrier for it. Uh, and, and actually there is, you know, some research going on in terms of using it for, for vaccines, single dose vaccines as well. So watch the space. What about pressurized meter dose inhaler? And this is a busy slide, but I'll talk you through that. Okay. The most important thing here is it requires coordination. Okay. And, and virtually no child is able to do that. So in children, never use PMDI on their own. It has to be through a spacer. Even up to 30% of adults can't use the PMDI well on their own. Okay. So what, what you got to do is that once you actuate the device, so you got the canister in here uh, where there is liquid and the uh, uh, propellant in there. Uh, and then when you press it, that opens up to the atmospheric pressure. It, under pressure, it generates aerosol. Okay, but as it, in it, in it, it's quite cold initially, and as it travels, you know, it will generally warm up a bit, and then generate the particles in the, the right size. Okay, and now the propellant, you know, it used to be CFC, now it is HFA, and that is what transfers the you know, gaseous state into uh, that real um, particle into proper aerosol, which will go into your lungs. Okay. Why do you shake? So whenever I do this uh, session in person with uh, registrars, with, with doctors, I say, I ask them, why do you shake the inhaler? And very few people are able to give the answer. The reason you need to shake it is because you don't mix the liquid salbutum or all the corticosteroid with the propellant, then they will settle down over time. It's like if you're taking a smoothie, then you know, the things separate out, they settle down and then it won't generate a proper aerosol. So the reason you shake it, and if you tell this to your patients, they understand why, and then they will do it. So you need to shake it, and for every actuation, you need to shake it, okay? Then you mix the propellant with the liquid medication. And also you need to wait in between shaking, because otherwise, you know, the temperatures, when you press it, there's generation of energy, there's heat, and that might also affect the, and the um, how the propellant and the, uh, liquid medication might work. So you need to give it time as well, okay? So shake it in between, give it time. If you only use them um, without a spacer, then really a large proportion, um, up to half, even more than that, goes and deposits in the oropharyngeal region, goes into your gut, doesn't have any therapeutic value and actually causes more side effects. And only you know, a quarter or even less than that might, might uh, reach the airways. While if you use a valve holding chamber or, or a spacer, and it could be in any healthcare setting. You know, there's evidence from South Africa where they've studied used Coke bottles and then use them as spacers, and then that works as well. So anything's good, better than the PMDA on its own, okay? And it also minimizes the local side effects and, and the systemic side effects, there is no GI absorption, and you, you, there's no need for coordination. I think that's sort of just going through the spacer and in detail. I'm, I'm going to skip over that just in the interest of time. Uh, same for PMDI, the principles that I told you about how newer um, things are coming through in terms of um, improving the, uh, the aerosol deposition for, for PM and the use of um, all these medications. Okay, now, and with, you know, COVID has obviously allowed us a lot of this, but, but also before that, a lot of smart technology is coming in and, and that has now allowed us to enable, you know, patients and family to, to engage with, with us by online and mobile technology with apps that, you know, they can measure adherence. Uh, they may actually monitor the symptoms on a daily basis. And if they find that, you know, their uh, lung function is starting to creep down or the nitric oxide is starting to go up, then they might be brewing an exacerbation. And it also has reminders and ongoing education not only that, there are websites which actually might monitor the environment as well and, and might um, tell you about, you know, that the pollen count is high or there's a thunderstorm coming, which might be triggers for different people's asthma. So there are some of these websites might be able to use that, those technologies as well. I think these three slides next, the three slides are also really important because you know, there are a lot of misunderstandings about um, inhaler techniques on part of the patients, on part of the parents, on part of the doctors. You know, uh, uh, if you ask the families, you know, they, they are quite confident, children and especially the parents, about you know, their ability to use an inhaler. And a lot of research has shown, you know, almost two thirds report that they can you do it very well, they're doing it regularly, but actually when you ask them to demonstrate, only 2% are able to do it properly, okay? So overestimate in confidence in ability to use the inhaler. And actually, when you ask them, you say, oh, I use my inhaler most of the time, eight out of 10 times. 
but then you measure it objectively with the smart monitors, it actually is, is less than a third of that. You know, everyone thinks using an inhaler is easy. Parents, uh, children, doctors, nurses. Is that so? So I think there were studies which have been done. So where parents and they, in primary care, they were shown how to use it. And when they came to the hospital, it was assessed less than a third, despite having been given comprehensive instructions, they're able to show that they can use it properly. Okay, you've shown them once, is it enough? Not really, you need to keep telling them every time because you know, this was a study which looked at it. They've been shown once, proper instructions, they do it properly, they understood the instructions, you've given them a leaflet, they watched the video, they come next time, they miss some steps. So keep doing it again and again, okay? Because skills do drop over time, okay? And when you do give repeated instructions, every time you see them, tell them about the inhalers, tell them how to do it, okay? Then does the, the ability to use does improve. And this is unfortunate that, you know, the, the errors in the inhaler use are still so prevalent. So this is a, a beautiful review, which has been done over time. It's looked at 40 years use of inhalers. And they've looked at, you know, a lot of papers, 144 articles, you know, almost 60,000 observed tests of technique and over 40 years. And then they looked at whether the technique was correct and 100% steps were observed or all the critical steps were definitely observed when a, a single critical step was not missed. Acceptable if it was three quarters or poor if it was uh, you know less than 50% or one critical step was missed. And um, I think there are various reasons why you know people have poor inhaler technique. And, and some of these are listed here. You know, it might be related to the device. Then I think what you need to do is ask the child to look at different devices, get them to play with it, tell them which of the inhaler are they more likely to use it, which is the one they prefer. Then use, then use the, choose the molecule, okay? They might go for a turbo header, then use the appropriate molecule. Rather than saying, this is the steroid I'm gonna use, get them to choose the device and then use the molecule. Now spend time and effort with them, okay? Give them repeated instructions. I've already I've alluded to. And, you know, uh, use of technology, smart inhalers and um, reminders and, um, and, and also on a basis, you know, go to schools, teach in the schools, and nurses going home, do, doing home visits, having those policies in place. And, and, and this is easily available, but the, you know, this is an important slide, you know, so which are the crit critical and essential steps? So remember, we talked about the shaking, we talked about, you know, uh, breathing away from the device, um, breathing out completely, using a good seal, uh, and then firing the device and breathing it slowly, but in children, always use um, and, and, and a spacer in between, okay? And then they need to breathe in uh, sort of uh, for five to 10 seconds, taking at least five slow breaths. And similar for device, when you primed it, um, breathe out completely, uh, make a tight seal, breathe in and do sustained deep inhalation. Remember the energy of the inhalation is what is going to produce the aerosol and then the breath hold and standing up and gravitational sedimentation. Okay, uh, and, and, and as I said, this article, without going into details, there are more errors in PMDI use, even with spacers as compared to DPI use, okay? So I think, and the commonest errors were about the coordination, if you use it on its own, never do so in pediatrics, but were also how deeply they're sucking in and then how long they hold their breath for, okay? <clears throat> this is a depressing slide. You know, you might think that, you know, Dr. Tomer, I showed us about all those stalwarts of pediatric respiratory medicine in the past. Uh, and we might think, oh, they didn't have as many good inhalers. They may not have known about inhalers. We know it and we are doing it better. Actually, are we? Not really. This is very depressing, you know, over a 40-year period. And when it was split out in two 20-year epochs, you know, we are still making the same mistakes. So hopefully what I'm talking today, you, you take it in, into your practice and make sure that you know going over things again and again and again and teaching them again and again will help improve the inhaler technique and therefore improve the outcomes. I think uh, the technique is, is um, you know, when you talk about starting to talk about adherence to treatment, uh, it might be to regimen because you know they, you might have said you know you need to take one puff of this inhaler twice daily. They might take one puff once daily or take two puffs twice daily. They might take two puffs once daily. Okay, so that is non-compliance. Adherence is the better word. Concordance is the, the most uh, sexy kid word, uh, word in, in, in the parlance now. But uh, in a, whatever it is, whatever word you want to use, 
there are a lot of complex factors. But if it is to the regimen that you told them, that is regimen non-concordance, while it could be the device and device it may be related to you because you haven't taught them to teach it. So that's non-competence because you haven't taught them how to use it. Or there are, you know, you told them to use a spacer, but they still, that is intentional non-adherence to the device. That's contrivance. Even when you told them to use a spacer, they don't use it. And, and now with electronic adherence monitoring, you know, whatever device you can use, which can be linked to the smartphone or, or the iPad, you, you know that, you know, these are at the bottom, you can see that whatever it will tell you, it's a dose counter and also it tells you the time of the actuation and it will log it and it will send it straight to your, your smart devices. Because when you look at electronic adherence of um, treatments, you know, from a lot of studies, it's been shown that it's only about, they take the treatment half the time, okay? So this is objective monitoring, not just asking on what treatments are you taking. And part of uh, the variable adherence might be our fault as well, because the goalposts have shifted. You know, in 1996, we were saying that you know, if you were reading to use salbutamol, you know, more than three times a week, um, then you know, you should maybe adjust your maintenance treatment. Now we are saying even less than that. So I think part of that because we might have confused the patients as well. Um, and, and I think ongoing education um, is important, but also exploring the beliefs that the families might have about the treatment, about the disease, will help you address the, the, um, the uh, poor adherence to treatment. And there's no doubt that regular treatment is better, but we know most of the people only do it half of the time. But even then, if you keep emphasizing the importance of that, then there will be better control. And actually, with regular um, instructions, with regular exploring and dispelling beliefs, you can achieve very high, and I'd say it's 50%, but you can go up to 92% with when you're doing, elect and that was by electronic monitoring. So you can achieve high adherence. And I think the partly that would be which device to choose. And I think try and stick to one particular device for the particular um, molecule that different molecules you're gonna use. And, and as I said, if the patient chooses the device, they're more likely to use it because they know how to use it, they prefer how to use it. And I think this is the, the summary for you know all of us who are prescribing different dev inhaled devices that you need to know. And I hope I've talked you through some of the principles. You need to know what devices are available through what and uh, what classes as well, and what patients will use. Train them on a regular basis at each visit. Okay. Uh, and and in a teaching to goal method, so as I've told you, you know, give instructions, ask them to explain it back to you then ask them to do it, show it to you again, and then keep doing it again and again on three occasions. My last two slides, um, you know, so the, this is a, a unique way of delivering inhaled medications, which is a, you know, it's called a soft mist liquid inhaler, but unfortunately it's only available for the long acting anticholinergic. So it's not yet available in, for an inhaled corticosteroid. This is a bit of a mix between a nebulizer and, and a, a pressurized meter dose inhaler. You, you don't need as much uh, coordination uh, but you know it's expensive and it's only limited to certain um, certain types of um, um, in medications. Okay, we got a lot of new stuff on the blog, but does it improve outcomes? You've seen that it does improve some patient satisfaction, but when you look at uh, measurable clinical outcomes, the evidence of that is as yet lacking. Okay, so the final slide, I think. Um, People talk about ABC and various things in medicine. I'm talking about all A's in asthma. I think when you're seeing somebody with asthma, and every time you see them, keep asking the question, could there be an additional diagnosis? The child's got asthma, could they have developed whooping cough if the cough got worse? Is there an alternative diagnosis? Is there adverse environment in terms of allergens or air quality, indoor and outdoor? What about adherence? You know, are they adhering to the device? Are they adherence to the regimen? Because if you just sit on the path and you don't do anything, you will get run over. And I think we've got a lot of devices with a lot of new type of inhalers available to help you guide that, to achieve a diagnosis, to monitor, and to get better clinical outcomes. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Bhatt, for this excellent, informative, elaborative talk. Uh, I'm sure all of you have enjoyed, and there are a lot of questions. Before requesting, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pujana. I would like to request uh, our panelists, uh, Dr. Bad, uh, Dr. Fatima. Dr. Fatima is senior consultant pediatric pulmonologist. No need 
to introduce Atletico Hospital. Everybody in the Dubai, UAE, and GCC countries, they know her. Dr. Joshi, past president of Dubai Pediatric Club, senior specialist pediatrician at Prime, and he is the president of the International Pediatric Conference, which is going to be held next month. So I would like to request viewer to register. And Dr. Kalpula Sengupta, senior specialist pediatrician, head of the department of pediatrics at the NMC Specialty Hospital, and secretary of the club. To start the session, over to Dr. Kalpna, please. Thank you, Dr. Sahrab. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhatt, for this uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Bhatt has not only clarified our basics, but has made us aware of the absolute latest uh, in the field of uh, pulmonology and some of his references being as uh, recent as two weeks. So thank you for that. Uh, I want to start this panel discussion with a question posed to both the panelists and their perspectives on it, uh, starting from the diagnosis. I think Dr. Uh, Bhatt has repeatedly mentioned that we should not rely on the symptomatology alone in labeling a child as uh, being an asthmatic. Now in um, office pediatrics, not in pediatric pulmonology practice, but in office general pediatricians uh, practice, uh, how often uh, do we follow this up with tests or PFTs or should we follow it up or should, how should we choose these patients? Uh, I would just like to get your opinion on that. Um, do you want me to go first? Uh, yes, yes, sure. Yeah, um, I think as one of the, you know, the ERS task force also recommends that uh, um, you might use the um, the peak flow, which I think should be possible in, in any setting, okay? You might not have an electronic peak flow meter, that's preferable, but it might be possible in any setting. I think, remember this, the symptoms vary over time and in intensity, but you need objective evidence of airflow limitation. You need objective evidence of variability. Now, evidence of inflammation and bronchial hyperresponsiveness, I take it will be difficult to achieve for a general pediatrician sitting in, in an office, but the airflow limitation should very much be possible. So you should tell the parents uh, to measure their peak flow. And, and I think be a bit provocative, tell them to use it uh, six times a day, uh, four times a day, every six hours. Because I've told you, you know, if they only do it sort of 10 o'clock in the morning before they go to school and six o'clock when they come back from school, you might get normal readings over that two week period. So I think that is important. And exercise tests, um, you may not be able to do it in your office, and I don't know the setting in Dubai, but th that is something, it's, it doesn't require a huge setup. I think if there is a central place where, because you need a treadmill in, in a proper room, and, and a person who supervises the child to do the test, run on the treadmill for six to eight minutes, get them to work to their you know, 80% of the submaximum heart rate, do the lung function before and after. Now, I don't know how common it is for... Uh, pediatricians to be using spirometry in, in office practice in Dubai. Um, if that is not the case, then you, you clearly, because in, in order to document reversible bronchoconstriction, you have to do spirometry. You, you do not do it based on peak flow. And uh, it, 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 reversible bronchoconstriction is not based on peak flow. So the most you would be able to do if the setting is what you describe would be uh, structured assessment of symptoms over different periods in time, seeing the child at different times, you know, when the child's well, when the, ask the parents, when the child's unwell, ring us, we will see you. When the child's well, the child's unwell, and getting them to monitor peak flow, both when the child is well and unwell, multiple times a day over two weeks. Sure. Does that and, answer your uh, question? Uh, yes. And this uh, pertains to the age group of six to 11 years, as you mentioned, or? Uh... Well, well, six and above. A, a clever five-year-old might be able to do the peak flow as well. And I, I think um, a, a three-year-old might have early onset asthma, but you, you would rather not label them as asthma as yet. It's sort of preschool multi-trigger wheeze. Uh, okay. okay. Dr. Yeah, Fatma was think. coming in. Uh, yeah, I would like to start with thanking you, Dr. Jaish, for an amazing presentation. Um, honestly, um, it was 
uh, very nice, uh, illustrative, and with an updated uh, data that I got to learn from. Uh, thank you so much. Um, when it comes to your question, Dr. Calvana, the basic um, basic form of diagnosing asthma in an, uh, a simple clinic or a simple OPD. Um, I totally agree with Dr. Jaish, but uh, Dr. Jaish, you should note that um, availability of uh, spirometry is very difficult, which, is, which helps the diagnosis of asthma. It's very difficult to find uh, in, uh, in clinics around uh, in Japan, unfortunately. And um, uh, I don't think people are uh, aware about uh, performing spirometry and, and even the interpretation of the result. Um, so unfortunately, uh, and neither the peak flow, which is very simple, as you mentioned, um, people are not using it uh, very often. It can guide to the diagnosis and it can um, actually give you a lot of information about the maintenance of the steroid and how the child is doing uh, during therapy. But I would suggest a more simplified a way of diagnosing asthma, which is also recommended by uh, Gina. Um, uh, uh, I would say actually just a trial of a therapy uh, for, for a couple of months and see the response. If you have a response, then you have a diagnosis of asthma. Uh, it, it's like a basic ABC for the diagnosis of asthma. Trial of a therapy, you see the result, and that's it, you have the diagnosis. And I, I think I did mention that, but you got to be careful about that, that, you know, that like, you know, eight week trial, time limited trial, you might see a clear response, but I would say do at least two such trials. So what I tell families is that if you're gonna do that, do the treatment. If it works, stop it. If it doesn't work, clearly stop it. And then do it again at a different time of the year in a different setting, okay? So be mindful of, uh, time-limited trials of treatment, you know, it's, it's a reasonable approach, uh, but be mindful that, you know, it could be a coincidence that the child has, and especially if they only have cough as a symptom. If they have, you know, you have heard of these, you have seen definite difficulty breathing, and there is all that variability, and you do the time-limited trial, fantastic. But I think if it's only a cough, don't do it. I think you might be, you know, doing more harm than good there. <clears throat> Yeah, definitely, Dr. Jais, you have to monitor the child and um, you cannot just give them the trial and leave them. You have to monitor, the, monitor them, you have to follow up, you have to uh, have a, a direct contact with them and see how they are doing. And definitely think about differential diagnosis. Don't just treat and leave. You have to think about differential diagnosis. You have to look at the response carefully. And I would say history also is very suggestive of asthma. So uh, a wheeze and a cough, which, which is, as Dr. Jaish mentioned, uh, nighttime or early morning or um, uh, associated with exercise, laughing, crying, it can guide you to the diagnosis, but it's not definite as Dr. Jaish mentioned. And even for the assessment of symptoms, I think doing it in a structured way, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with or use uh, what's called asthma control test score. Uh, and I can show you a slide if you want to in a minute. And then there's also something else called CASI, which is Composite Asthma Severity Index. So the asthma control test score is, is asking the parents over the last four weeks, there are five questions and, and what do they answer? So yes, it is still relying a bit of memory, but it will give you some idea about how good the asthma control has been before in the last four weeks. And you should be doing that on a regular basis. And if you get a score more than 20, uh, 19 or 20, then that's good control. The maximum score is 25. But that is looking at asthma control. Once you have had a diagnosis, you do not use the asthma control test score to make the diagnosis. But I think what I'm emphasizing here is doing it in a structured way, asking the symptoms in a structured way. You need to say, does your child have a cough? Is it a dry cough? Is it a nighttime cough? Cough first thing in the morning. Cough when the heating comes on. Cough in cold weather. Cough with exercise. Cough with laughter. What does make the child's cough go away? 
the, when the child exercises, does they get difficulty breathing? Do they get whistling noise? Do they cough at the time as well? How soon after exercise does this happen? Because some children might have dysfunctional breathing and that, you know, the child may not be fit. That happens straight as soon as they start doing exercise. When you have asthma and you get exercise in this bronchoconstriction, you've been doing exercise for a good five, 10 minutes before you start coughing, before you start developing chest tightness, before you get wheezing. So when after starting exercise does the symptoms happen? Do you have more than three episodes of wheezing in the last six months? Have you had any hospital admissions? Have you had use of oral corticosteroids? What was the response to steroids? Has your doctor, your primary practitioner given you an inhaler? How have you used it? Has the inhaler helped you? All those symptoms would be very helpful in building up the picture. If you cannot in any way get objective evidence of um, airway bronchoconstriction. And I can show you if you want to, if you're really interested what an asthma control test score would look like. Um, So you can carry on talking about what I'm bringing up the slide, but uh, okay. So what you do is, in the, you ask about the symptoms in the last four weeks. How many? How much of your time did your child's asthma keep you from getting as much work done at school, home, whatever? So five questions, five scores. Okay. Every time you see a child with asthma, use this. You've got to use the asthma control test score. When you have a score of more than 19, it's good control. When it slips less than that, there is loss of control. The composite asthma severity index also takes into account lung function because you could have somebody who's got mild asthma, which is poorly controlled, or you could have somebody with really severe asthma, but they are adhering to treatment. They might be on biologicals and it's well controlled. So I think the asthma control test score doesn't give you the whole picture. You could have mild asthma, but poor control, severe asthma, good control. So therefore the composite asthma severity index is more helpful in that it tells you about the symptom use. It tells you about the lung function, the level of treatment they are on, and actually also the number of exacerbations. So you might have somebody, you know, th there was a term that people used to use in the past. You shouldn't be using it, something called brittle asthma. So you could have severe asthma, which is good, well controlled, but they might still have some episodes where they suddenly have loss of control and a severe exacerbation. So this composite asthma severity index gives you the whole picture. But again, this is doing it in a structured way once you have a diagnosis of asthma. Right. Uh, <clears throat> there is a question about the roller allergy testing in asthma, in one case of asthma. Do you go for allergy testing, heat test? And if the test is positive, what is your experience about immunotherapy for asthma? So I think, as I, as I mentioned in, in one of my slides, that remember, you know, there is a variability over time, but also the allergy test, whether you use a skin prick test or you use um, the specific IgE, is only telling you about sensitization. A positive test is not a diagnosis of allergy, okay? A person who is sensitized, when he gets exposed to the allergen and they develop clinical symptoms, that is allergy. Now, in terms of inhaled allergens, I think what is now well recognized is that if you have early, multiple, and perennial aeroallergen sensitization, so a child who is three years old is sensitized to house this mite, uh, different types of molds, cat and dog, so early, multiple, perennial, rather than just tree and grass pollen, for example, early, multiple, perennial allergen sensitization is a significant risk factor for allergic asthma. It is not a diagnosis of asthma because you could have, as I say, there, are, there have been studies which have been shown that the child might be sensitized, might be exposed, but they're doing fine. And then they get a virus, they get a rhinovirus infection, their asthma gets bad, okay? So you've got to bear that in mind. Now, in terms of immunotherapy, and I think um, this is 
controversial in the sense that so far only grass pollen sublingual immunotherapy and has been shown to improve outcomes in allergic rhinitis very significantly. And they might also, in a child who might be at risk of developing asthma later on, stop that from happening. Dr. Sengupta was mentioning earlier about the allergic march. So, uh, you know, it may not necessarily happen in that order that you have um, in a, in a, in a seborrheic dermatitis, uh, you might have eczema, you might have food allergies, allergic rhinitis, asthma. It doesn't have to happen in that sequence and it doesn't have to happen all the things. But in some children where they have allergic um, rhinoconjunctivitis and they were going to progress to asthma, giving them sublingual grass pollen immunotherapy did make a difference. Sublingual immunotherapy with the grass pollen uh, treatment also improves the allergic rhinitis significantly. In terms of uh, how's this might, I think there is less robust evidence. And I think actually the latest Cochrane review is still saying that you know, the, the jury is out. So preventing how's this might exposure is very, very difficult in, in children who are very sensitized and uh, grass pollen, uh, how's this might immunotherapy has yet not shown to be beneficial in terms of number and severity of exacerbations. So uh, I would like to ask Dr. Fatima, yeah. uh, what is your experience? Uh, you know, uh, in UAE, the number of uh, cases that we see with allergies, allergic rhinitis, um, asthma, uh, it's pretty high. So which are the allergens that are common uh, in UAE? And uh, does, uh, you know, adequate treatment of allergic rhinitis play a big role in these children? So if you could. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, going back to Dr. Joshi's question, I, I wouldn't do any energy test unless I have history. And um, as Dr. Jash mentioned, um, uh, the result, the, the, uh, uh, the result from the test uh, does not uh, always correlate with the symptoms you have. So sometimes you have a, a very high class of allergy, but uh, without much symptoms. So uh, it doesn't correlate. And when it comes to immune therapy, as Dr. Jaish mentioned, yes, uh, sublingual, and it helps uh, uh, for allergic linitis, but there are subcutaneous as well. Um, for those who has like uh, a total IgE of um, in a high number above 1,500, and those who have eosinophilia, blood eosinophilia, and even those who have uh, severe, I would say moderate to severe atopic dermatitis with asthma, they can benefit of those um, kinds of immunotherapy. But there are certain criteria that you have to follow when it comes to uh, uh, which immune therapy, uh, what, what kind of asthma, and how, how you treat them. Um, Dr. Jayesh, you want to add and something? Uh, are you mentioning about the biological, so NTIGE and NT, so NTIL5? Okay. So I, I think, that, you know, that my take on immune therapy was, you know, the grass pollen or the house this might, uh, so you, you're doing sort of a passive immunization. Clearly the biologicals, and I haven't even touched that, you know, that's a completely different talk. They have, you know, they are very, very effective. I absolutely agree with you. And they're, they're in there selecting the right child. They, they have a very important role. But, but coming back to treatment, even before the, uh, the uh, immunotherapy or indeed the biologicals in, uh, in a treatment with antihistamines um, and Montelukas, Dr. Thomera, I mentioned earlier about the leukotriene serotonin antagonist, it's the unified airway. So for allergic rhinitis, um, the combination of Montelukas, antihistamine and nasal corticosteroid spray. And it's a bit like the inhalers. I think you need to show the child how to use it properly. So I think asking them to cross the hands like a pharaoh using the you know, the nasal spray, leaning the head forward and then squirting it and not sniffing it straight away so that they don't swallow it. So proper technique for the nasal corticosteroid spray, along with oral Montelukast and oral antihistamines should be the first step, along with whatever allergen avoidance that might be possible. Then considering, you know, with, with uh, immunotherapy, with Grazex or how's this might, um, but, you know, less evidence for that. And biologicals across the board of allergic conditions for urticaria, um, eczema, uh, asthma. 
Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Josh. Going back to, to you, Dr. Talbana, and uh, the, the common um, um, allergy we have in Dubai, I would say how does mite allergy um, associated with allergic climate? There's too many children with, the, with the, this allergy. But then, uh, which um, goes in the same level or comes after the house dust uh, mite allergy, I would say multiple food allergy with, with atopic dermatitis, you name it. And it's, it's very common in children. Um, um, not to forget um, mentioning a cow's milk protein allergy, which, which start very early as well. And it can uh, be misinterpreted with other diagnoses and it can be missed very, very easily. And then I, they usually start with cow milk protein allergy and then the other allergies comes along once they start uh, 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 having mashed it. Like to interrupt here with your permission, I was reading an article. Nowadays, animal four in allergic rhinitis, they are playing a major role. In fact, in some places, they are the leading. Now, with the trend that uh, all children, they want to have dog, cats, and this at home, and they don't want to get rid of those. Uh, what is your opinion regarding Because this is becoming a fashion now. I mean, it's a mode of fashion, and it is becoming one of the leading causes also. I mean, apart from house transplant and pollen, animals. Well, I would like to know your comments regarding this. That's a very complex area. I think there is evidence that actually early and a lot of exposure might be beneficial in terms of later development of these. So if you have a child who has got really bad asthma, you have clearly shown that the child is sensitized to dog and they have a dog in the house and the child's getting admitted to the hospital every six weeks, no question, get rid of the dog. But if you have a, a new set of parents coming to you, they, they've got their first two-year-old child who's absolutely fine. He doesn't have uh, any pet allergies, anything at all, and uh, any food allergies. And the, uh, the parents are not atopic. They don't smoke um, because I think smoking is known to increase um, sensitization. And they're getting another child and they want to bring a cat in the house. Should they bring it? I think that they might not be a bad idea because you know, early and a lot of exposure is actually beneficial rather than harmful. So I think you, you got to weigh up what the clinical situation is. But if we have a child who is sensitized, multiple symptoms, taking treatment, getting admitted, positive test, get rid of the pet. Yeah, I sometimes. totally agree. However, animal dander uh, allergy, not very common in UAE. I know in Europe, it's very, very common. And I totally agree. Early exposure, even to food that the patient, that, ch that the child can be allergic to, like uh, fish, I would recommend to start it as early as possible in order to have desensitization. <clears throat> Uh, well, uh, not only children, but I think adults also go, get so attached to the pets that it's it's really difficult to tell them to get rid of their pet, you know. Uh, yeah. So uh, there's an interesting question uh, regarding uh, family history. If somebody has a approach to a child with a positive family history of asthma or allergies, doctor wants to know, can we skip any steps in the diagnosis? And if so, what steps? So you already have yeah. established... Uh, yeah, well, I think that the risk for that the child uh, to develop asthma is greater than the general population, but you, you cannot quantify it, and, and you, you cannot really use that as a diagnostic tool. It, it is just a one small piece in the thousand-piece jigsaw that you're putting together. Okay. So mm -hmm. we will just stick to the protocol. Even then. Can okay. anything be done to prevent the onset of asthma in such uh, cases where there is a strong family history? Uh, right from say early period. I think that's a very difficult question. I don't know. I have an answer to it. Anyone has? I think people have looked at a lot of things, um, including um, uh, maternal diet and then different types of supplements, or avoiding different things like uh, uh, fish oil and vitamin D, or, or you know not um, uh, taking certain foods. Uh, and 
I, I don't think there is any, and, and uh, probiotics, you know, there's evidence in terms of uh, maybe eczema, but not in the asthma, so maternal diet with probiotics and um, early breastfeeding and is beneficial. <clears throat> avoiding any smoke exposure right from pregnancy uh, through, um, you know, both the parents, not just mom, but indeed there is evidence for grandparents. So, you know, I think there are studies which have shown that the grandmother smokes, but the mother doesn't smoke. Even in the third generation by epigenetic mechanisms, the ch child to be born's lung function could be affected. So I think avoiding smoking, avoiding pollution, um, having a healthy diet and a healthy lifestyle, um, is what you can recommend, but there isn't a single intervention which has been robustly in an evidence-based manner shown to be effective in preventing the development of asthma. I would like to interrupt here, sorry. I was reading Gina, Gina 2021. Now we are, when we are writing uh, ibuprofen, all pharmacologists in asthma, you know, suddenly they take the phone even in Gina say it is astaminophen which is causing and they don't mention bofen. I want to clarify here because this is a common every day when we write first, as soon as patient goes to pharmacy, telephone come doctor, this is asthma, you are giving a bofen, ibuprofen. I mean, even Gina say it is astaminophen, not bofen. In fact, I was reading some articles, bofen, I mean, controversial because of anti-inflammatory effect might be even beneficial. I want to know your comment regarding this because this is a common question for all. It's a very good question. And I think your observation is spot on. Yeah, I think paracetamol is as if not more likely to, to cause bronchoconstriction. So I think the approach should be that in a ibuprofen is not contraindicated in asthma unless a child has previously reacted to it by developing a wheeze. Okay. If the child's got really high temperature, which is not coming down or needs significant anti-inflammatory effect because of you know, fracture or whatever, and they need pain relief, and you tried everything else, and the child's got asthma, they can have ibuprofen. No question about that. I, 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 I'm not sure that it as an anti-inflammatory, because it's not the uh, type of inflammation. It's the eosinophilic inflammation in most people with asthma. There could be some with the neutrophilic inflammation. There could be some with mixed but even if it's mixed or posse granular, as it's called, in neither of those inflammatory patterns would ibuprofen work as an anti-inflammatory. So ibuprofen as an anti-inflammatory does not work in asthma. Ibuprofen should not be contraindicated in asthma, a child with asthma, unless they've definitely had a wheeze in the past. Thank you. Thank you. There are a few questions from the audience. <coughs> Sorry. The first one is about how long can you continue inhaled steroid in a uh, four-year-old with asthma. It can be any age group. How long and when do you decide to stop or taper off? I think um, if you are confident of your diagnosis of asthma, then it can be as long as it needs to control the child's symptoms. Being on inhaled corticosteroids controls symptoms when you're using it. It does not modify the natural history. And especially in the preschool age group, I think there are very good long-term studies which have shown that if you say there was, for example, a study from America, which looked at using um, inhaled fluticasone for 50 micrograms twice daily for two years, and there was a clear difference in the number of um, what is called symptom-free days between the two groups. And then for the third year, they stopped the treatment and the two groups converged. So telling you that when you use them, there is good control of symptoms. When you stop using them, the symptoms recur. So if the child needs to continue using because the symptoms have recurred, then you use it as long as you need to. There is now very good long-term data from the CAMP studies, which has looked at the effect on final adult height, because I think that's what parents mostly worry about. It's a steroid. So at age 25, so you're looking at over 20 years of exposure, and there is a minimal slight difference of half an inch in height between those who were treated with regular helicorticosteroids versus those who were not. ATP itself affects growth. Poorly controlled asthma, multiple causes of steroids affects growth. So I think there are factors that if your asthma is not well controlled will affect growth. And therefore, if your child needs steroid to control the symptoms well, it can be as long as it is required. 
with the caveat that you're looking at, you're monitoring everything which I talked about on a regular basis and using the lowest dose which controls the symptoms. How about then Montel there's no problem. How about Monte Lucas? Uh, there is a question. What is your experience about the neuropsychiatric uh, manifestations of long-term use of Monte Lucas? Fantastic question. I, I think re really very good question. And this is what we all need to be wary about. So in the last five years, there is an enormous amount of literature about the neuropsychiatric side effects. When it first came on, uh, on use, I think it was, mostly people were describing about nightmares and sleep disturbance and, and tummy aches. But I think over the last five years, there is a lot of you know, all types of neuropsychiatric problems. And so be very mindful and then be very vigilant about monitoring that. And I don't think it, it, it's time related. So it's not that the longer you use it for, the more likely you're going to get it. It either happens or it doesn't. But it can happen at any time. So you need to be vigilant all the time. Yeah, the flip sure, side of that is that... Sorry, Dr. Sorry, Dr. One study, FDA on April 2020, said then the warning, a box warning about the Monte Lucas. Same year, September, FA, uh, FDA, from FDA group, they went and studied uh, the difference between those who study, I mean, those who took inhaled corticosteroid and Monte Lucas. There was no difference. I mean, they didn't find any difference that same amount of people who get neuropsychiatric complaints with inter, uh, I mean, uh, steroid and Monte Lucas. FDA changed the, I mean, I can give you the exact, 1st September 2020, FDA report. They said there is no difference. And they removed that box, the warning box, which was given earlier, same FDA people. It is not as, it was before. Now they have relaxed about the, I mean, if you think it, 1st September 2020, that was April. This, I, because I, I went to a little this was there I just mentioned. I, I would respectfully disagree here because I, I think uh, when you look at retrospective, you know, reporting bias is always there. And you know, a lot of studies across a lot of companies have shown that there is increasing prevalence. And, and I suppose you know, that, that's what I was going to say earlier. The, the flip side of that is that the effectiveness of Montelukas is also not as much as it was thought to be. I think if, you know, there are some people who are suggesting, and there's evidence that it may not be much better than a placebo. Like we in the UK had done a study called WAIT. So that was using Montelukas for short periods in, in preschool VZ children. It was a multi-center study, more than 500 children, randomized control trial. And what was shown that, you know, Monte Lucas does not work in the vast majority of the children in that category. There was a small group, 5% of that, who, if they had a certain polymorphism in uh, prostaglandin metabolism, ALOX, uh, one um, uh, m m uh, polymorphism, then that group responded well. So you might be justified in using a short trial if it works very well and it changes the child's life in terms of asthma control then fair enough, but be vigilant about monitoring the neuropsychiatric side effects. Uh, Doctor, but if you look at the GINA from the, I mean, I think 1993, these charts are coming. If you compare, suppose 10, 15 years back and chart and now, if you see Monte Lucas is occupying in this, I mean, the column below, we, this is going always, it is there. I mean, it is occupying more space every year. This I'm not saying. I'm not saying don't use Montelukast. What I'm saying is that you know it only works in a small proportion of children, and when you use it, be vigilant about the side effects. That's what I'm saying. So that brings us to the topic of uh, are there different uh, phenotypes within asthma that we should be looking at? Do we have any pointers to say that this age group will be you know better off with this particular uh, prophylactic medicine or definitive medicine? So any ideas on that? Um, I think it's a very good question. And uh, leave aside phenotypes, we are now moving on to sort of endotype, so you know, the biomarker-driven uh, management as well. A phenotype is, is a collection of clinical symptoms that, you know, or symptoms Clinicians and signs that would, help yeah. you put together, isn't it? Yeah. And um, I, I think when you look at evidence, like, for example, the Montelukka study I was talking about, or even for inhaled corticosteroids in preschool children, and effectiveness is based more on the frequency and the severity of the symptoms rather than the underlying nature of inflammation that they might be. 
So I think if a child has got a um, you know, family history of A to B, not necessarily that child will respond better to say a child who does not have it, okay? Uh, but if they have, you know, Dr. Patma was talking earlier about the eosinophil count. So high eosinophil count will very likely suggest that this child will have a good response to inhaled corticosteroids. So if a child has frequent symptoms, so by that you mean more than four courses of steroids in six months, or very severe, they've been to HD or PIC on one occasion, they've got a high eosinophil count, blood eosinophil count, you would be able to do it. And they've got the variability and the pattern of symptoms that I talked about in great detail and I keep talking about, then that would be a good phenotype to say they'll probably respond to inhaled corticosteroids. As opposed to that, uh, I think if you have um, you know, a child who every time the child has got difficulty breathing, you see them and you never hear a wheeze, okay? They have a constant wet sounding cough rather than a, a, a dry tickly cough. They never have, even when they're well or unwell, they never have a raised eosinophil count. And you have, as uh, it was suggested earlier, given an eight-week trial of steroids and it's not worked, then don't keep using it in the hope that it will eventually work and this child's got asthma. Well, clearly not. This is something else going on. Does that answer your question? Yes, very much so. Uh, I think we moved on to the treatment and before that there are a couple of questions on uh, still on allergies like uh, Dr. Saad wanted to know uh, when we do allergy testing is the skin test better or is the uh, blood test better so maybe Dr. Fatima can tell us about this. Uh, it's not a matter of which is better than the other. Uh, skin prep test, uh, you will get an answer immediately. It's much easier uh, to perform. You can do it in the clinic and it takes a few minutes to get the result. Um, it's the availability of the test. Uh, RAS test um, costs a lot, has a high cost. Uh, it will uh, cost the patient a uh, 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 little bit of blood and you should know what you are testing as well. Uh, you, you should know what the child is allergic to in order to order so many RAS tests. I, I would say I would start with a prick, uh, skin prick test and see what I get. And then I would go further with the RAS test uh, if it's needed. So it's not a matter of which is better, which is, um, which is bad, but it, it, it's a matter of what I'm looking for and, and what I'm diagnosed. Again, would you choose a particular patient population to do these tests within? Yeah, again, those who have allergy with suspected allergy, a child who's clearly having asthma, only asthma, no suspicion of allergy, I wouldn't go for, for any allergy test unless it is indicated. But those who have a reaction on allergen, then yes, I would do the uh, allergy tests. Uh, those who, who, for example, go on a grass um, uh, ground and play and they come with runny eyes, runny uh, noses and uh, wheeze and cough, yes, I would suspect an allergy and then, it, and then do the test, but not, not when it's not required. So it depends on the case. Right. So as our focus uh, today was uh, to be on um, the devices and Dr. Bhatt has discussed in detail about monitoring pulmonary function tests. I just want to know like, uh, how often do we really do these tests? Because in older kids, yes, it is very easy, but what about younger children, infants, preschoolers? How do we go about assessing their respiratory function if required? Well, absolutely. Infant lung function is a very well-established technique, but that is not available outside very highly specialized centers. Uh, uh, and then clearly, by definition, if you're doing infant lung function, then you need the child to be sedated. And it's done with, you know, you measure the VMAX FRC with the, the squeeze method. And um, I think more and more, um, what is known as uh, multiple breath washout uh, is, is uh, being done in younger and younger children. I think that is helping you assess um, uh, the ventilation inhomogeneity. Uh, and then, you know, asymmetrical distribution. So, you know, 
it's very well established in cystic fibrosis. Uh, well, it, it helps you detect much earlier than lung function um, uh, impairment in, in um, airway function, and, and it is also sensitive to change. So if you're using new treatments and you, you, you are able to pick up change in, in um, uh, multiple breath washout tests. Uh, so I think um, uh, infant lung function very well established in, in specialized research centers um, and um, clearly multiple breast workout is also now very commonly being done. I think that the difficult age group is the preschool age group because I think uh, keeping those children still, getting them interested and getting them to cooperate to the technique is the most difficult bit. But there again, I think some very innovative incentive methods are coming so, you know, keep them occupied with their favorite videos. And then you have incentives on the computers, which will allow them to try and achieve those incentives, may get them to do um, the preschool spirometry as well. Okay. And uh, other than cystic fibrosis, what other indications would you really go in and, uh, you know, do these tests in infants or preschoolers? So I think it, it could be, it's not condition specific. It could be done in child with severe bronchopulmonary dysplasia, child with interstitial lung disease. So I think in, in any, because remember, if you do um, whatever imaging you're doing, it is only giving you idea about the structure. So CT scan, a detailed scan will tell you about what the lung looks like. It doesn't tell you for a minute what the lung is doing. So lung function testing in, you know, oxygen saturation is a lung function test. You know, it's telling you how well your lung is functioning. So detailed um, um, oxygen, you know, spot saturations, overnight oximetry, um, multi-channel monitoring, cardiorespiratory monitoring, uh, TOSCA studies uh, are all lung function tests. Uh, multiple breast washout. So in a child with bronchopulmonary dysplasia or interstitial lung disease, uh, you know, you do a CT scan, it might look very bad. You might decide where to do a biopsy. But if you want to assess response to treatment, you might do lung function testing like there is so much evidence of doing the uh, you know, nitrogen washout in, in BPD babies or in ILD, uh, and it's very sensitive. And it, over time, it tells you how it changes. So response to treatment and prognosis. Um, yeah, I would say when it comes to asthma, uh, um, spirometry and uh, Impulse uh, oximetry could be the best, uh, uh, but LCI, multiple breath washout, um, is, is very good for uh, monitoring cystic fibrosis and the management of the cystic fibrosis and the progressive uh, progression of the disease, as well as uh, you can look at the uh, BCD uh, population with LCI and multiple breath washout. Uh, a fair note that uh, uh, Dr. Jaish discussed uh, could be more appropriate for asthma patient, but also um, very, very good indicator for uh, cystic fibrosis and PCD and those kind of chronic lung disease. Uh, but this uh, equipment, they are quite expensive, uh, very difficult to find everywhere. It's only available in large centers where they have um, uh, cystic fibrosis centers and a uh, uh, big population of such patients. Um, I, uh, Yani, spirometry is very, very simple test available everywhere. It's good for asthma patients. Um, and it will diagnose and it will uh, help you to monitor the, the um, uh, control of asthma as well. As simple as this. So. Right. We had a session on uh, cystic fibrosis. So barring cystic fibrosis, I just uh, would like you to give us some pointers that these could be the cases that should be referred to a pediatric pulmonologist for further testing or PFTs so that the uh, clinicians get an idea. Uh, you know, just one, two, three, four, five, uh, what you would like commonly, because as you know, our current conditions and uh, you know, that we are basing mostly everything on a clinical judgment than uh, doing spirometries that often. I would say in any case that you have doubt on, <laughs> any case <laughs> that you doubt the diagnosis, just refer it. Up. Okay. I mean, we don't have a problem seeing extra patients. So um, it's actually better to uh, send to a specialist when you have a doubt rather than um, not knowing what you're doing. 
uh, and not knowing the diagnosis. So, um, and we can always refer the patient back once we have the diagnosis established. And once we see that this child does not require a, a specialist uh, uh, follow-up, we can refer back to the GP for further follow-up. Um, I'm, I'm maybe very generous when I say that, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but of course, there are, um, there are certain diagnoses uh, when you have to refer to the uh, specialist. Um, I, can, I can just wrap them for you, but um, anything that you have no control over, better to send, or you have doubt on, better to send for a specialist. I think Dr. Jaish can answer this uh, question. No, I think I, I absolutely agree with you, but I just wanted to make a comment there in, in whatever healthcare setting is, as you said, I think referring a patient for a second opinion is never a bad idea because I think if I refer somebody for a second opinion and that person confirms what I had said, then the parents will say, oh, what a clever doctor Dr. Bhatt was. And if mm -hmm. they then give something new to the patient, then they will say it was good that Dr. Bhatt referred because we got something new. So it never is a bad idea to get a second opinion. Yeah, sure. Very well said, Dr. Jaish. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dr. Bandari has two questions. Dr. Bandari is one of the senior pediatricians in our group. He wants to know the role of ketotifen. It was uh, widely used a few years ago. And what is the role now? And he wants to know whether citrus juices can trigger alcohol. So Actually, Along Sorry. with that, there are uh, three other senior pediatricians who have asked similar questions uh, along the similar line, I would say. Where has aminophylline disappeared? Where is hydrocortisone now? Where is ketotifen in the management of asthma? So if, maybe you can club them all together. Uh, never used um, or is never going to use ketotifen because I think that's now gone. It's no better than so ketotifen, sodium chromoglycate. They are disappeared. They are no better than placebos. Um, uh, aminophylline actually very much so, uh, even oral theophylline. So that has made a comeback. So as well as a bronchodilator, it, it's it's in a, even an anti-inflammatory. So there, there are, you know, uh, Maybe about two percent of my severe asthma patients will be in, a, in my clinic will be on theophylline. So we would try all that, and if uh, it's not work, then we would consider going in biological. So theophylline is very much there. And in acute setting, I think um, I'm, I'm, I can't talk about the acute setting, but you know whether you use uh, aminophylline, IV, salbutamol, or IV uh, magnesium sulfate, that's um, uh, a very much specific unit dependent. I think a question about citrus uh, juices. Fascinating question. Um, there was a study about 30 years ago done from the Brompton unit where, where they looked at, and especially in Asian kids in London uh, who were drinking a lot of Coke uh, and, and they had significant bronchoconstriction uh, after whenever they had Coke. And I think they, they monitored and did it in a very good way. Coke pH is 2.5, so acidic pH. And, and by reflux or reflex, irritation of the esophagus, can cause cough and bronchoconstriction. So there is that biological plausibility. I'm not aware of any other way in which citrus um, uh, juices can cause asthma. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm basically from India and I know that culture about you know, eating cold and, and sour things and asthma, but there is no medical proof apart from the fact that that acidic thing might be a trigger in some pe people. And, and to, to flip that, I think, you know, uh, Linus Pauling, uh, uh, the, the famous doctor who got Nobel Prize for two Nobel Prizes, and uh, he was the one, uh, Dr. Vitamin C. And, and he, he was very much in favor of vitamin C, but that's complete nonsense. Vitamin C does not have any role in preventing or boosting your immunity. Uh, so I think there's still a lot of myths around uh, vitamin C and citrus, both for prevention uh, or benefits and harm. Uh, I can only say that that acidic nature might have some impact in symptoms. Can I be hydrocortisone? What is the role of hydrocortisone? Oh, oh, I, oh I, I think you know. Like, so, if a child is admitted to intensive care with a severe attack of asthma, then you know if they're not able to have oral penicillin. You use IV hydrocortisone. That, that's absolutely no problems. Uh, adding to that, actually, theophylline is uh, added to step four and the 
uh, treatment steps of asthma and GINA guidelines. So tefillin is there, tefillin has good effect. Um, uh, um, I forgot what I wanted to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, what is the, yeah. Okay. How do you define severe asthma and how will the management differ in severe asthma? Uh, so I, I think um, this is slightly judgmental, but you know, when you talk of a child with um, severe asthma, it, it's better to look at, uh, maybe call it difficult to treat asthma. And then what is difficult? Is it the asthma which is difficult to? Or is the patient which is difficult? And I'm sorry, you shouldn't say that. But you know, often you know, if there is a lot of problems, all the A's that I mentioned about, you know, the adherence, the allergen exposure, and all that. But if you have addressed, you've got the diagnosis right. So there is no additional diagnosis. There's no alternative diagnosis. There's no allergens, or you control that well. They're adhering properly. There is good air quality. Everything is right. And despite being on more than 800 micrograms per day of inhaled budesonide these children are getting frequent symptoms, that is severe asthma. Now, remember, I'd also defined something called CASI. So you could have somebody with really severe asthma. They might be on the treatment Dr. Fatma was mentioning. They might be on omalizumab. They might be on mepolizumab. So they are, have got severe asthma, but they are now well controlled, okay? So severe asthma can be well controlled. Mild asthma can be uncontrolled. But severe asthma is that once you've addressed everything basic and that can be modified, and they still need more than 800 micrograms per day of inhaled budesonide to control the symptoms. That is severe asthma. So they will be uh, on biological Well, as, as appropriate. So if they've got the right ESN cell count, or if they've got you know high IgE, or if they've got associated uh, uh, atopic dermatitis, then dupilimab might be an, an option. But yeah, th those are the children. So, you know, they might be on Montelukast, they might be on a combination of uh, long acting beta 2 agonists and on theophylline. And despite that, they're having more than three exacerbations in six months. They're having, they've been to intensive care. Then you put them on biologicals. There are some asthmatics who come with very high eosinophilic count. I mean, is there a condition known as uh, eosinophilic asthma and is the treatment different? So if you got asthma and you got a high eosinophilic count, then that is eosinophilic asthma. I think and it's tricky because blood eosinophilia necessarily isn't the same as airway eosinophilia, isn't necessarily the same as bronchoalveolar lava. So I think there are studies which have looked at if you've got a child with asthma, you do a bronchoscopy, you get a sample, you might have a different eosinophil count in the lava as compared to the biopsy if you've done it versus the blood. But leaving all that aside, if you've got a high eosinophil count of more than 300 cells per cubic millimeter, and you've got definite asthma, that's eosinophil asthma. And the treatment will be different or same? Well, inhaled corticosteroids will work very well. Um, Montelukast, Dr. Tomera is very fond of that. That could work very well as well in a selected number of children if they don't get neuropsychiatric side effects. But if despite all that, they get um, frequent exacerbations and symptoms and they are um, corticosteroid dependent, oral corticosteroid dependent, then um, using, for example, mepolizumab, which is NTIL-5, might reduce the... Um, uh, number of exercise reasons by 50%. That's sort of the ballpark for most biologicals. But for omalizumab, which is anti-IgE, it's very restrictive in the level of um, the total IgE. So it should be between 70 to 1500. If it's outside those ranges, then then it won't be, it won't work. May I ask for one question regarding compliance? I asked this question to Boske, the, the head of the Gina who had come here. Mm -hmm. You know, in India, I remember when you say somebody you have leprosy, they go and hide, they don't come out. When you say you have, um, I mean, uh, Hansen, with the name of scientists, they, I mean, take the medicine. Here, but as soon as you use the term asthma, the parents, especially, I mean, they, they don't continue the compliance with the treatment is low. If you say, suppose, hyper, uh, here they call it, uh, hassasia or allergy. Your chest is allergic, same medicine. I mean, what you give for asthma, what you give for the hyper. But when you use some hypersensitive, they use it. I want to ask this question. Do you think in future the name asthma will be changed? 
because it affects the compliance of the patient. Whatever you do, the people, they have this phobia, like, uh, I mean, Leposi Hansen's disease. When you use Hansen or tuberculosis, you use Cox, they use take uh, treatment. When you say tuberculosis, they go and hide them in a take treatment. Do you think asthma name will be changed in future? A very good question. I think it, it should change, but not for the reasons you are mentioning. I, I think I, 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 I see what you're saying, but I don't think that should be the reason to change the name. I think um, Fernando Martinez, who is a, a very good uh, pediatric pneumologist in America, wrote an editorial in, in the New England Journal about 15 years ago to say that we should do away with the term asthma, because he, he, I think he very provocatively suggested that it's like saying, you know, my child's got fever. Well, the fever could be um, otitis media, or it could be meningitis, or it could be osteomyelitis. So, you know, he was saying that asthma is like that. Well, actually not. And, and then when you start looking at sort of endotype driven disease, but that is what uh, <clears throat> you need to be. So in order to determine, look at what's called treatable traits. So if the child has got high eosinophil count driven asthma, then you treat that high eosinophil count and the asthma gets better. So you, you might start using those terms, but I don't think you, you would want to change the label because it will improve patient's treatment adherence. So one more question is about the viral infections in asthma. We know there is a uh, clear correlation between RSV and asthma. Is there anything uh, between COVID and asthma? Can COVID or post-COVID lead to asthma? I don't think we got enough time um, um, after COVID to, to be able to say much longer time because we've known about RFV for much, so much longer. And actually rhinovirus is as much, if not more, a culprit than, than RSV. Um, COVID is interesting. I think um, uh, there are some suggestions that uh, biologically mecha led mechanisms uh, might be in children with asthma. Actually, it might be beneficial to have asthma in terms of COVID infections. Not that COVID causes asthma, but if you have got allergic asthma, then actually you might be protected against COVID because high IgE seems to downregulate ACE2 receptors in the lungs. And I think because the COVID virus enters the lungs through um, the ACE2 receptors, people with allergic asthma might be protected against COVID. That's the suggestion. There is no definite proof against it, but there's some early work to suggest that. Second thing is that the, you know, steroids and then maybe even inhaled steroids might reduce the uh, severity of the COVID illness. So I think the COVID asthma equation in terms of um, do people with asthma get more severe COVID illness? Uh, there is a suggestion that may not be the case. Does COVID infection lead to asthma? I don't think COVID has been here long enough for us to be able to answer that question. In Dr. Fatima, what is your experience? Have you seen these questions? In Gina 21, in the, what is new, uh, this question in, I think, five, six slides, they have answered, they say, in fact, during COVID, asthma decreased. That could be one, they are wearing masks, second, as mechanism you said, overall, it is decreasing rather than increasing. Yes, yeah, several factors. I think people were afraid people were taking the treatment more, they were adhering to treatment more, they were not in contact with viruses. So many factors might be responsible. So that's right that, you know, the admissions have decreased in various hospitals. But whether COVID leads to asthma, I think that we haven't got time enough after COVID to be able to answer that question. Dr. Patrick, we see COVID with asthma and COVID in cystic fibrosis. Do you find it is worse or uh, same? Okay. Sorry, say that again. Uh, Dr. Fatima, I just wanted to know the local experience, whether COVID in asthma or cystic fibrosis is worse than before or the same? Uh, I can say when it comes to my asthma clinic during COVID, um, I was in heaven. Uh, I never had so much free time uh, during uh, COVID infection as, as I had these past two years. Um, uh, actually, even those patients who were on inhaled corticosteroid and controlled with the inhaled corticosteroid, uh, they didn't attend the clinic because partially they were scared to come to the hospital and they were afraid of COVID. And um, um, uh, plus, uh, their asthma just disappeared during COVID time and during the, um, uh, the restriction time. Uh, and the um, um, 
the closure. Uh, and they were not using uh, their inhaler for about uh, a year plus, and they were doing very, very well. And um, I did not see, um, I can only see, I, I can only say that I've seen only one patient with asthma who had COVID uh, pneumonia. Uh, but the rest of asthmatic patients, they were doing very well, even with COVID. Um, so that patient with uh, COVID pneumonia and asthma, I, I cannot generalize it. Uh, um, the conclusion I took that um, we should revise um, the chronic inflammation definition of asthma, because uh, if you have a chronic inflammation, it should be there all the time. Uh, but then during COVID, during one and a half year, there was no asthma. Um, um, when it comes to cystic fibrosis, um, uh, actually, they were not affected. My cystic fibrosis, they were doing fine. None of them got COVID um, uh, coincidentally. So um, I cannot relate cystic fibrosis with COVID and, 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 and the consequences of that because none of my cystic fibrosis got COVID. I don't know why. Um, and I agree with Dr. Jais, it's very, very early to take conclusion, but I can just sense that uh, COVID and asthma, no, no correlation. So uh, what would be the um, explanation for asthma? Asthmatics not presenting during this year, is it like their exposure to allergens, viruses? or uh, exercise induced. I mean, some subsets could be explained by those acute exacerbations related to these. Children um, are sitting at home, not going to school. I think all of those, you know, taking, of the, taking their treatment regularly, not getting exposed to viruses, um, exercising right. more, um, all of yeah. that, you know, less stressed about everything. Right. Um, I would say the environment uh, in general, because uh, uh, when you really think through it, there are um, um, uh, children who have genetic predisposition for asthma, but they never get asthma. Once they travel abroad or they change environment, their asthma uh, comes up somehow. So I think the whole change of environment and the, the restriction we went through, um, less exercise, less exposure, um, helped against asthma somehow. But we, we're, not, we're not proposing here that children should not uh, do any activity no. or stay at home or isolate themselves. No, they have to live their normal life. So um, it was good. It was good for asthma. But uh, uh, it's not recommended. Well, less traffic pollution, less cars on the on the roads, yeah. all that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Environmental factors. Yes. Uh, Dr. Bhatt, you mentioned that you would like to elaborate on uh, no role of nebulized OPD treatment in asthma. So a word on that. Yeah, I think it's been well known since the 70s. There was an epidemic of uh, increased asthma deaths in adults with the use of uh, home sal nebulized salbutamol. So I think there are two issues. One is home nebulizers are driven by air rather than oxygen. And I think that actually will make the VQ mismatch much worse at home. People rely much on that treatment and delay seeking help uh, and, and come to the hospital late. And then that leads to poor outcomes. I think that's been known for a long, long time. The, the more recent um, work that's been going on around the world is something called Sabina program. So this is SAB, short acting beta agonist in asthma use. And I think it started off the Sabina one, two, three and now Sabina 4. So that's a program worldwide looking at over-reliance on, on um, not just nebulized, but even inhaled salbutamol. And if, if you go through, and I put that in one of my slides, if you go through more than three, uh, I think in, by some counts you could say two, depending on how many uh, inhalations there are in the canister uh, uh, per year, uh, then you, know, you are over-relying on it and then you will be using less inhaled steroids. So you're not treating the underlying problem. Your asthma is much worse control, poor outcomes. So I think over-reliance, physiological mechanisms, uh, 
driven by air rather than oxygen uh, are, are all the reasons that you should not be prescribing home nebulized treatment. That's different for cystic fibrosis where you use home um, uh, antibiotics. That, that's completely different. You know, those nebulizers are very different. <clears throat> Uh, what has been your experience, Dr. Fatma, as you know, uh, here, uh, almost every other person has an nebulizer at home, so. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. It's a, it's a UAE culture to have nebulizer at home. They don't even consult you when they need a nebulizer. They just go and grab one um, in the pharmacy and they they start nebulizers uh, with the medication and they don't even consult you. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's really difficult to convince them because they think um, with the inhaler, uh, because they don't see the uh, medication particles, so they think it doesn't help. So they, they have to see the vapor. So they believe there is a medication which reaches the lung and it helps against uh, asthma symptoms. Uh, but I usually take it easy with those patients. I give them time until they are more convinced. Um, I, I uh, usually uh, advise them um, um, to use a spacer with the inhaler, um, uh, 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 proposing that saying, um, it's much easier to use, it's much faster, you, it's portable, you can take it everywhere, it's very light, uh, uh, it goes fast, and um, uh, it has same effect as nebulizer. So you, you need to convince them and you need to get them to start the inhaler, um, but I usually take it easy with them until they are really convinced and then I shift to uh, inhaler and they see the result immediately. They, 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 they do believe you afterwards that, yeah, it, it helps, it's much easier, it's cheaper, it's convenient, it's, you can travel with it, you can do, go everywhere with it. So it takes time, but then they usually shift back to the uh, inhaler. Um, some of the patient takes time because um, they've been using nebulizer for a long time before uh, they reach uh, to us. Uh, those patients prefer to continue on nebulization because they see it gives, it gives a good effect for some reason. Uh, those who comes with a nebulizer, okay, I continue for a while, but then ultimately I shift to inhaler. I think but the whole... it's a culture of nebulization in Dubai. I think the whole point of having this discussion with around 300 people in the meeting is that actually, in a, yes, they might buy it on eBay, but they certainly shouldn't be buying it from our recommendation. And then that will then make Dr. Fatima's job much easier going forward. Thank you. Yeah. Somehow the minute you uh, uh, talk about inhalers, it's as if you, uh, the, you have confirmed the diagnosis of asthma to their, in their psyche. And if you're using nebulizers, it's only for hasasia or for cough. You know, uh, this is what we come across. Compliance of name and take the, you can treat the patient, but don't, because you know, that is sick there, type of that, they don't take. You are giving whatever you give, they don't use. I was talking to one of the members of uh, Gina years back. Said something better than that. If patient uses nebulizer, then not uses. The, I mean, you are giving the method was with the space. If they use well and good, they have to. But when they don't use, at least they should not stop nebulizer because they are going to land in a severe asthma and uh, get admitted. I mean, this was a, his opinion. Of course, best is all advises the messages to use meter uh, those inhaler with the spacer. That is the thing. But, but that too should be inhaled corticosteroids because I think that the over reliance both on salbutamol and salbutamol via nebulizer that is the dangerous thing. Not just salbutamol via the nebulizer; it's also the over reliance on the salbutamol. So even if they're using the blue inhaler via the spacer and using it too much, that itself is quite dangerous. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Sahra, both uh, inhaler and nebulizers are mentioned in GINA uh, guideline, but the preferred device is the inhaler MDI with a spacer. Uh, uh, but then 
you have the nebulizer as an alternative and and few patients not so you don't go and start with the nebulization immediately so it's it's just an viable alternatives uh, to uh, inhaler and this recommendation comes uh, are evidence based uh, they are not just like that you know so they are both equal but then the preferred is the MDI with the space. And uh, what about the dry powder inhalers? Like uh, sorry, there are patients who should be dependent on uh, nebulization, such as uh, cystic fibrosis patient, um, PCD, other chronic lung disease. These patients, they have to have a nebulizer. It's, 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 there is no space for uh, MDIs or spacer. Yes, if they are on uh, inhaled corticosteroid, you can give them an inhaler, but then they have to use the nebulizer for their other medications. So it depends on the case. So when it comes to asthma, yes, definitely uh, um, MPI where the spacer and a mask are required. Yeah. Sorry, Dr. Kerwan. I know, yeah. I was just going to ask about the efficacy. Uh, is there a difference when somebody uses a, an MDI versus a, a DPI or their comparable efficacies in trials? Um, in, if a PMDI with a spacer and a dry powder inhaler, not much difference. Uh, but I think a PMDI on its own versus dry powder, no question. DPI much much better. Oh. Actually, I, I you know I, I did a st study and I was one of the subjects and I uh, so we looked at uh, urinary salvitamol ex excretion after um, uh, giving different types. Uh, um, you know, so salvitamol via different routes as in a straight through a PMDI with a spacer, with a dry powder, different types of dry powder devices. And, and you know, the best was with DPI. Uh, and, and the PMDI with spacer was second best, but the PMDI on its own, no, no comparison. You know, there are certain cases where you can use the nebulizer um, um, as, a, as, a, as a preferred, the preferred uh, device. When you want, for example, to give uh, a mixture of, of uh, two or three medication. You cannot mix it by inhaler, so you do it in the nebulizer itself. Um, also, when you want to go like higher doses uh, of inhaled uh, corticosteroid, you can use the nebulizer, but it's not, yani it's not a first line device to use. I think the mixture would, would really only apply in a healthcare setting, isn't it? The patient really shouldn't be doing at home. So if the patient needs a mixture of treatments to control their asthma at home by a nebulizer, they should be in the hospital rather than doing that at home. Uh, and, and I think the, the same applies to the higher dose, because I think if they're needing a much higher dose, then actually either they may not have asthma or you then think about adding in. So I think even doubling the corticosteroids, you know, there, there is studies in pediatrics there where they looked at four times the dose of inhaled corticosteroids during an exacerbation from baseline, and that did not achieve a reduction in number of exacerbations. So um, I think a requirement of higher dose is telling you that you need to look at alternative treatments rather than continue using that. Mm -hmm. There's a question from Dr. Satish uh, Kadambed, who wants to know what's the role of adrenaline in, in acute exacerbation? Very good question, fantastic question. I think adrenaline is the same as salbutamol in the sense that it, it will, it is both alpha and beta two receptor agonist. So it will cause what salbutamol does, but uh, it also has cardiac side effects. It will do the, you know, it will increase the heart rate and increase the blood pressure. Uh, I think therefore that's why the selective beta two agonists were developed. Some people with multiple um, atopies and comorbidities and life-threatening, previous life-threatening episodes of asthma do get given adrenaline and auto-injectors um, to be used in case of a very significant attack of asthma. But that is the IM adrenaline that you would use as in a food allergy anaphylactic reaction rather than the IV or subcutaneous that you would want to use it as a bronchodilator. 
uh, adding to that, adrenaline mobilization um, could help in, uh, uh, infants who are below one year of age due to the receptor um, uh, they have compared to salbutamol and uh, epitropium. Um, adrenaline is more used uh, in croup patients rather than asthma. Yeah, so in asthma, there is, I, I don't know, we don't use adrenaline much in asthmatic patients, but small infants, yes, they do benefit of that, and crew patient, for example, as inhalation. Sure. Uh, One so, last question on my side. We have been talking about uh, control of asthma for so many years. Do so you think there will be a cure for asthma? And if yes, uh, in what line? I wish I could win the Nobel Prize in medicine, um, but no, <laughs> no I, I don't think so. I, I think uh, a, a cure, um, unlikely. Uh, we, we can control it well, but uh, asthma is not going to go away. As Dr. Tomirai also showed us that Hippocrates, it was there in the times of Hippocrates, was there in India and Egypt 2000 years BC, um, I suppose in some form. So it, it's not going to go away. Uh, we can control it better. So in terms of control now, my question would be, how important do you think is uh, patient or parent education? And what do you suggest should be done for that? Because even when we are talking about nebulizer versus MDIs, uh, giving an emergency plan to the patient is important. So a written plan, which they follow. So, you know, if our rapo is good with them and if they are continuously following up with us, even if they have a nebulizer at home, we can actually... Uh, uh, educate them regarding that. So what is uh, your take on uh, parent education? Tools for that? Uh, and... Absolutely critical, absolutely critical. And, and I think it starts off by exploring and, and, and trying to address some of the beliefs they might have both for the disease and for the treatment. So I think explaining them, you know, the, that iceberg, the symptoms, the bronchoconstriction, the inflammation and the bronchial hyperresponsiveness, telling them that your child's breathing tube are narrower because they are being squeezed, they are swollen from inside, they are more twitchy. And therefore, in order to make that better, you need to reduce the swelling inside. So explaining them the disease, explaining them the treatments and doing that regularly and, and uh, in, in providing them with backup um, information, both as written or on, on nowadays electronic medium. Yes. Uh, the clock is going to get midnight. Yes. You know, it's, it's still we are having people are following it. Till morning, they will ask questions. You have to have found the doctor. Uh, I will just take Dr. Fatima's take on this question and then yeah, please, please, wrap up. No, from my side, from ah. time. Well, I, I have an advantage. I'm three hours behind, so I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> Actually, no, no, questions are there. <laughs> uh, patient education questions is very are there, crucial, as Dr. Jaish uh, mentioned. And um, if you look at GV guidelines, they repeatedly mention patient education and the relationship and the partnership. Uh, between the physician uh, and the caregiver. Uh, just imagine if you don't understand your disease and what medication you're getting, are you going to be compliant to that, uh, to, to the management? I don't think so. So making them understand what's going on and what you're proposing uh, for, for a management is and step number one and the management actually so um, discussing the disease itself and making them understand i think uh, it's uh, the it's the initial step of the treatment and i think talking to the the child and the young person what is important to them what do they want to achieve i often ask them if you did not have asthma what is it that you want to do that you're not able to do because you got asthma, okay? So for them, lung function is not important. For them, nighttime cough is not important. For them is, they want to go and play football. They want to, you know, be, be with their friends outdoor. So what do they want to achieve and how can we help them achieve that? I think that's a really important part of the education as well. Absolutely. And I think uh, older children, um, definitely we can talk to them directly show them videos, have, uh, so the reason for asking this is like, uh, what I want to know is, do you have certain tools, pre, uh, ready tools in DHA that you use that we can make available to everybody 
you know just like we have baraim now for developmental skills we are every patient that comes to us with delayed development we tell them okay fill up this questionnaire and do this and you'll get help similarly do we have something to fall back on uh, we do have videos we do have brochures we do have information leaflet but i i i don't have time to show them the video because it takes time information leaflets yes i do briefly just mentioned the um, uh, disease of asthma itself, what happens with the airways and um, what the medication um, uh, do. And then they get the need that they, they can go through uh, the internet as well and read about asthma. But I advise them not to do much of that because they, they can... Um, uh, they can get the wrong information. It's better to ask us as a physician. Um, uh, yani mostly it's a verbal information we give in the clinic, but then we have a respiratory nurse who take over this uh, part of education when it comes to um, uh, uh, devices, uh, um, technique, uh, general asthma education, uh, leaflet, uh, printing papers. Okay. It's, it's part of the nurse um, uh, work in the clinic rather than physician. Um, you know, you have a tight schedule, you don't have time yes. to, to go into details, so you just take the important part of that and then you leave the rest. Once you see them, they are convinced, so you leave that part to the nearest people. Uh, this is what we do in the five. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Actually, both uh, uh, the talk as well as the panel discussion have added to greatly to our knowledge. So thanks to both of you. Uh, okay. Yeah, Dr. Okay. Sarah. So, Thank you so much. Uh, Boss said, again, everything goes back to hypocrite. That is why always I start my talk. What he, has said, he said is a quotation. It, before uh, treating a patient, know what kind of person is having disease rather than to know what kind of disease a person has. So knowing the person, you see, 400 BC has told that everything, even definition of asthma, he has put everything. I mean, that is my history. I go to the history and go, what we are saying. Thank you very much, Dr. Ma, Dr. Fatima, Dr. Kalpna, Dr. Joshi. Really, I mean, the people are sitting still, I'm sitting there, 300 are sitting this time midnight uh, following our program. We had uh, viewers from all over the world, Azerbaijan, some. African countries, there are so many countries. This shows that how uh, effective and beneficial oh, you it you. was the talk. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. I would like to take uh, this opportunity uh, opportunity first to thank, thank Dr. Jaish for amazing presentation, um, um, uh, very scientific uh, answers on the question. I'm very pleased to uh, meet you and um, uh, get to know you. And I would like to take this opportunity to announce that we have officially moved uh, to the pulmonology unit moved to Al Jalila Hospital uh, since uh, two days back, and we are in full function. Um, uh, I, I, I should say that it's been two terrible days. Uh, I've been very, very busy, and we still don't know the system, but we, we've been working very hard, full with patient, emergency, ICU, bronchoscopy, you name it. <laughs> so we're, we're in Jalila now, so if you have any referral or any, any patient to help with, we are, uh, we are there for you always. And thank you, uh, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, and um, uh, it's been an amazing night. Thank you so much. One is one, uh, uh, Dr. Professor Bhatt, you please uh, give your final note and give an announcement. Dr. Bhatt, please. Um, well, thank you. It was a, a really good, uh, stimulating session, uh, and, and I enjoyed delivering it and meeting all of you. And uh, as Dr. Fatma said at the very beginning, you know, um, COVID permitting, maybe we could do this again in person. Thank you. Absolutely. Definitely, we would love to. invite you here in person. 
<laughs> we'll have in fact, we wanted to have a discussion on so many other topics which we thought we would have time for, but uh, I mean, I think know, uh, I, I do a lot of uh, I do a lot of uh, neonatal lung disease. In fact, I've just published an ERS monograph on neonatal respiratory diseases. So I think that if, if that is something that interests oh. you, then you know, it actually you, you can uh, there's a podcast on the ERS website. Uh, um, the whole spectrum of respiratory disease across newborns. So I think that was really good as well. <clears throat> Definitely, I think doctor, we have such should, programs. Yeah, and we should invite you on our uh, upcoming uh, pulmonology conference, inshallah. We are planning it uh, next year. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Sarab <laughs> will be very pleased. So, <laughs> yeah, it's been a while since we had our pulmonology conference. So mm -hmm. uh, we're planning to have it next year. So Dr. Jaish, we will be very glad to have you over in Dubai uh, participating in our conference. And yes, about respiratory um, and neonates, that is a very nice topic to talk about in the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the viewers, first of all, staying here. And uh, after that, Dr. Joshi will give comment. Uh, I would like to thank our sponsor, Dr. Pooja, uh, from Himalaya for sponsoring. On 26, we are having a webinar. Uh, Dr. Sandeep uh, Mordeka from UK, he's our thank speaker. You. So on 26, uh, link I have given, they can join us. So uh, I would like to thank everybody. Dr. Joshi, final remark. No, no, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. Thank you. Good night. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ma, Dr. Uh, Fatma, Dr. Kalpana, Dr. Dr. Joshi, and all viewers, Tofiq, uh, um, Puja, everybody. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you all. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Thank you so much.